adjustments to the agenda. Jamie, I believe you had one. Uh, yes, you can strike the 1920 audit. We have the audit drafts back for several districts in the SU. We don't have it back for yours yet, but I expect that you'll have it and be able to approve it next month, which is much better <clears throat> than the timeline we've had in the past, but we still need to do better. But just know that we're getting close. Very good. Um, I, I would also like to add a uh, public comment, uh, an extra public comment uh, between 6-3 and 7-1. So that I think with the topics we're talking about tonight, it'd be good to hear from people before some of the people are up on some of the things we're talking about. So if there's no objection, um, I don't see my, it's hard. I don't, I'm not seeing my people. I'm seeing everybody else, but I'm not seeing people. Uh, my board members are, oh, I guess they're not on video. That's why. Okay. Well, good. Um, good. Other than that, I think we're good. Um, timekeeper, uh, Amy, you've done it for us before. Would you be willing to step up for that? Amy Wilt. Amy, are you there? Yes. Can you not see me? Yeah, now I can see you. Great. Okay. Yeah, I was giving you the thumbs up. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, that. Put yeah, my a, phone a, in. Verbal, a verbal thumbs up. Great. Um, I think consent agenda uh, five, uh, board comment. I don't know. We'll see five. Nobody's mentioned anything to me. Uh, reports of the board. Let's give that. Let's give that fifteen to twenty. Um, I think the seven one or well, public comment. We'll give that. Uh, what have we got? Twenty two people in there. I think we'd better give that thirty just to be safe. Uh, seven one. I give it twenty minutes. COVID nineteen impact on our side. I give that twenty minutes. Uh, announced tuition rate, I think, what do you think, Jamie, like five? Yeah, five would be fine. Okay, seven, four is gone. Articles of agreement, committee recommendations, uh, 20 minutes at least, maybe 30. We'll see how fast that goes. Outdoor learning structures, I think that's about 10. And sale of Rochester property, high school property is actually pretty quick. I think we can do it in 10. Uh, let's see how we do that. Um, and then as we did last time, a lot of times these action items end up uh, being covered in the discussion. Um, so let's not give them times yet. And then we'll give the final public comment. Uh, let's give it 20 minutes. If that sounds reasonable to everybody. Um, if I can't see you, um, uh, we can use this, uh, you see this little hand? If he puts up a hand, I can, uh, um, do you see that, Amy? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, if you want to stay, yeah, Carl just raised his hand. I can see that. I, I think that's a legitimate manner for voting if you do not want to be on video. Personally, I would prefer if we're in a discussion about an issue that we all be on video so we can see each other if you don't mind. But I, that's your, your choice. That's just my preference, being clear. Okay, good. Um, uh, let's move on to number four, consent agenda. 4-1, approve the minutes of Tuesday, December 1st, 2020. Um, uh, I actually have a correction here. Um, I misspoke when I was giving the estimates for um, the extra amount of money going to be spent to finish up the high school transfer. Um, and I said it was somewhere in the range of three to $6,000. And that is just the extra legal fees. Um, that is not the engineering fees. So um, I don't know how we put that in. Um, do we have to go to the specific place in the minutes to do that? Yeah, darn. I meant to do that before, and I didn't get that done. Um, I'm sorry, would we... Are you saying that that in the meeting you misspoke, and then after afterwards you realized the number was wrong? 
Yeah, that I, was I, I said the wrong people. thing. I knew I knew it was just the legal, extra legal amount that was going to be spent. But I just, in the ramble of presenting it all after our right. executive session, I got. Conf I did not speak clearly and speak exactly what, what that. That's. I, it ended up sounding like that was the total amount to be spent. Still. Right. Right. I, I understand that. I'm just. I'm just thinking back, years and years ago, to a, a VSBA training about what should be in minutes and, 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 and what you amend in minutes and what you subsequently correct in new minutes. Okay. And do you, do you, you and, and as I understood it, and this might be something that, that, that Justine might know more about, amending, you know, correcting the minutes is like someone was here or, you know, uh, this thing was, was, was said and it didn't, uh, you know, it, it didn't get properly captured is different from then we're correcting what we said because we were wrong. But I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm just I will, following my training. I think, thank you, Carl. I think your correction is taken um, right to heart. And I think what I'll do is when we get to the high school, the, um, the sale of Rochester High School property, I'll just restate the information there. I think that's the best way to take care of that. Great. Then I will entertain a motion that we approve the minutes of Tuesday, December 1st, 2020, and approve the minutes of Monday, November 23rd, 2020, um, as, as submitted. So moved. Thank you, Carl. Do I have a second from my, second. Uh, who is that? Justine. Thank you, Justine. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Megan, is that your aye? Yes, aye. And then Jenny, you had an aye in there? Yes. I should just call it down, that's easier. Okay, good. Great, moving on. Uh, do we have any board comments? Uh, Justine, let me go through our list here. Justine, board no, comment? You. No, Amy, board comment. Um, I do. I just wanted to, I'd sent uh, an email around. Um, there's a uh, community group that is interested in possibly using the high school shop space starting potentially as early as this spring. Um, in as Rod a rental, right? Uh, correct. Yeah. As uh, in, Ro in, Roche in Rochester, community groups have always been welcome to use areas of the high school building. In the past, it was uh, mostly the auditorium for performances, but these groups have also used the shop in the past. Uh, there is, There will be a need for further discussion around what would be required, particularly contacting our insurance to understand um, if community group use is or is not covered. Um, but by getting the ball rolling with a community use uh, could help forward the effort of a uh, successful community supported transfer of the building. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, there's logistics to work out and obviously an eventual board approval. Uh, but I guess I just wanted to make sure that, wanted to know at this time if anybody had any uh, major um, objections to just looking into this. Um, I, I sent you an email back basically saying, yeah, we really have, we need to know insurance. Um, I do know that actually the players had to get insurance. Um, most, or they have to have their own insurance, any, any renter that comes in. Um, uh, we'd also have to figure out um, cost benefit, whether turning on the heat is going to be worth the rent we're going to get, we're going to be paying. Uh, in general, I, I, and as, I, as you say, I think it's a very good point to make, uh, smoothing this transition that we hope is going to go through uh, to the town. Um, that's a great idea. So in that sense, I totally support that. Okay. Like um, I said, there's definitely more to be discussed and an eventual approval. So this is not giving approval. This is just, you know, it does anybody right now have like a big objection or can we go forward looking into this? Always okay. good to get it. Justine, do you have anything to say on this? No, Jenny. Um, I think I, totally agree with everything that Ethan had pointed out in terms of the, the logistics. Great. Sorry, Carl. Yep. Um, assuming that, uh, it's, it's cost, it, it, it's, it's, it's at least cost neutral to the board and assuming that, you know, again, it's, it's, uh, uh, a different groups insurance, um, uh, versus ours and, you know, our, our liability, uh, exposure is, is nil. Yeah, I think I, I think getting the, the 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 you know the community 
you know, uh, into the space, whether it's the auditorium or the shop, as long as, you know, as long as the, 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 the costs are covered and the, and, and, and the liability is, is protected. Megan. I agree with uh, you, Ethan and Carl, you guys spoke really well to it. Uh, as long as it doesn't cost us anything, I think it's a good idea. Good. You got what you needed, Amy. Good. Um, good. Other board comment, Carl, do you have anything? I do not. Thank you, sir. Oh, happy new year, everybody. I have that. Happy new year. I know I'm so businesslike. It's like, boom, boom, boom. Let's go. Let's go. Um, a lot of people are here. <laughs> That's good. That's what we want. Um, uh, 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 sorry. Um, I asked Justine, I asked Carl, Megan, do you have a board comment? Um, just happy new year and a quick, uh, my internet has been spotty this afternoon. Uh, if I, if I lose you, I might have to switch my location. So if, uh, I drop out, that's, um, I should be back within 10 minutes. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Jenny, do you have a board comment? I do not at this time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on. Let's get to our reports to the board. Number six, six, one, start with our superintendent. Uh, so you have my report in hand. Um, I'll just, I want to highlight that, you know, we're in the thick of budget season uh, tonight during the business manager's report, like the projection of uh, revenue and expenditures that many of you saw at the SU that we're rolling out monthly. We're going to walk the RSA board through that. You'll continue to get that in your packet moving forward um, month to month. And so we expect that that will address some. Uh, you'll notice we do account for the um, representation of um, reduced revenue based on, we talked about that at least one month ago, maybe it was two, um, because we have some students who we expected to be here choose to homeschool. And so we lost out on some tuition revenue there. So you'll see that projected and Tara will walk you through that. Um, the other thing I'll add is that I did um, extend the chief academic officer position ad for another month. Uh, to see if we can uh, secure any additional candidates for that position. Um, that's a, a really important position as we move forward to increase our system of supports and uh, coordinate curriculum and instruction across the SU. Um, they'll also be taking on other responsibilities, of course, in the SU office. For those, um, just a reminder, we did condense down the curriculum department from three um, and the grant position into this one position for next school year. Um, and that's the chief academic officer of MTSS. And um, of course, you know, I just wanna put a shout out to my team. I think they've worked really diligently um, in the face of our first um, experience with COVID-19 in our schools. And it's on in a discussion <laughs> item um, later in the board meeting. Um, I will say I didn't think I'd be with the Department of Health every day other than uh, Christmas over the break, but that's really what the reality was. Even Christmas Eve out in the parking lot at Tractor Supplies in Berlin as we were trying to navigate this situation prior to me finishing up my Christmas shopping. Um, so Ethan will chuckle. He knows I didn't start until noon on cr Christmas Eve. I did get it done by 3.30, believe it or not. So Good for you. Shout out to Berlin Tractor Supplies. And um, I'll entertain any questions folks have. Uh, you'll get um, what I'm hoping to be your final draft of your budget for 21-22 uh, next month. We may need a special meeting to put that one to bed. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're, we're certainly working diligently to try to get that thing really tight um, based on the parameters you gave us last time when we met in December. It just seemed like this agenda was right packed to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Good. Do we have questions for our superintendent? Amy? Justine? Carl? I do not. Megan? No, thank you. Jenny? No, thank you. Good. Thank you, Jamie. Let's move on to our principals. Um, so we had a really, I would say, effective two days of in-service on December 21st and 22nd. Bonnie led the RSUD staff uh, through more math instructional training, and we had some great conversations. The 
I even learned a lot. We, she gave a lot of examples of, um, you know, here's the problem from a standardized test. 20% of kids pick this, 40% of kids pick this, and, you know, another 40 pick this. Why these two answers were wrong. Why did kids pick that? And where would their thinking have gone uh, wrong? And like, that's how deep we're starting to dive into this to ask teachers to then think about where they need to back up their instructional practice to when they see that result in their data. So it was very powerful. They also participated in a lot of different um, in services that were all virtual. Um, ranging from outdoor ed, a lot of them uh, participated in one with Jolene Van Lint, who spoke, you know, specifically to self-care and just navigating through what it takes to be teaching during a pandemic and what that means for your interactions and how that takes a toll on you. Um, I would say that was probably something they all, a majority of them attended on the second day. And then they spent the afternoon rolling out and preparing further for being virtual this week. And I don't know about in Rochester, but in Stockbridge, we did have a staff meeting today and people felt a lot more confident in their virtual teaching skills and how it had gone with connecting with families and making sure kids were engaged and knew what was going on as well as families. So it's early, but they're definitely, we seem to be moving in a positive trend compared to last spring, which is good. Um, we are still working on some winter, winter wellness opportunities. We did, I think the exciting pieces, Cynthia Powers secured some grant funding that purchased um, cross country skis and some more like warm outdoor gear for our preschool and kindergarten students in both campuses. So we'll really be able to spend some time outside when we're back out there. And uh, Rochester teachers, uh, we had a different type of meeting today. We had a MTSS, multi-tier system of support meeting. Um, but we will be having a, a faculty meeting on uh, Friday. But at the MTSS meeting today, there were uh, three or four of the classroom teachers. Excuse me, Bonnie. Um, could you just remind our listeners what the MTSS stands for, please? Multi-tier system of support. It's, a, it, it's the support system that sort of underpins our, our school. Um, and the teachers that were at the meeting uh, were talking about how uh, how well today went, how much more prepared they felt uh, than than in the spring, which makes sense. We've had time to prepare for this virtual week. Um, I dropped into a kindergarten and first grade meeting this morning, and I was just amazed at the conversation that was going on uh, between our youngest students um, and how adept they were at turning their mics off, turning their cameras on, those kinds of things. Um, and I, my intent was to sneak in quietly so that no one really knew I was there. And as soon as I, as soon as I hit the button, they're like, hi, Mrs. Bourne, hi, Mrs. Bourne. So you, I found out there's no easy way to sneak into a meeting with, with K1 kiddos. A um, couple of other things, just to let the board know, um, as you recall, we applied for and received grant funding uh, to uh, install a ventilation system in the gym. And um, the manufacturer, the equipment, delivery of equipment was delayed. Uh, we submitted with Kara's help and the engineer's help, uh, submitted the paperwork to the Department of Ed um, to extend the deadline for the project to be completed uh, so that the funding would be maintained. Uh, we received word just before Christmas that that was approved. So the project will still be funded with grant monies, approximately $23,000. Um, at this point, I cannot give you a date for when the work will start because uh, the equipment has not yet uh, been delivered. So that I'll keep you uh, keep the board uh, informed of that. Uh, I guess the last thing there in terms of uh, grant funding is that both Rochester and Stockbridge received approximately $5,000 to purchase uh, refrigeration and freezer units for our uh, lunch programs. Uh, Good. I'm going to jump in. If you're, are you all done, buddy? Sorry. I am. I am. Yeah. I am. Um, two questions. Uh, first is, uh, obviously, we don't we don't know yet for sure if if in in person is coming back next week. I assume we are, but we don't know for sure. Um, I um, 
I have a question about our the beginning of the year, three hours minimum outside, obviously in the cold days, but um, what is the policy at this point? How will children be getting outside to increase their um, ventilation and increase their time there? And I saw Carl, I saw your hand raised. I'll get to you after that. Yeah, Lind Lindy and I have, have chatted about that um, a couple of times. Obviously, it's going to become increasingly difficult to have youngsters out for long periods of time as it gets colder. Um, there are also some things related to the curriculum that youngsters need to be, though, for short periods of time inside the building for. One of the things we've talked about um, is taking a 15-minute outside break every hour so that youngsters would go outside each hour. Could you repeat uh, that once again, please? Sorry. One of the things we've talked about, um, Ethan, is that we would, uh, we're talking about taking a 15 minute outside break each hour. Great. So every hour youngsters would be, would be going outside. Um, the obvious thing we're doing too is we're trying to maintain open windows where we can. Uh, we want, we're working to make sure that the ventilation systems are up to, up to capacity. Um, I think one of the, well, we'll, I'll, we'll talk about that under COVID-19. Um, okay. Good. Uh, hold on, Amy, let me get to Carl first. Yep. Carl? Um, first of all, uh, I, I, good luck with that. I really do not envy getting uh, pre-K and K and one kiddos in and out of mittens and boots on the hour. <laughs> We um, might stay in them, Carl. We might stay in boots and ski pants. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and keep the costume mm -hmm. colder. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the question I was uh, uh, wondering is, as I understand it, the state is going ahead with SBACs and science tests for the fifth graders. Um, and it Carl, has could to you just, Carl, could you just uh, acronym? Sometimes people don't know okay. what those are. Uh, SBACs are the Smarter Balanced uh, Assessment um, back given to all the kids in three, four, five, and six grades for uh, English language arts and for math. Um, it's fairly, it's a fairly decent, it's, it's computer-based training that's responsive. If you're, you're, if you're answering questions, it'll increase the difficulty. If you're answering questions well, it'll increase the difficulty. If you're, if you're not, it'll try to hone in on deficits and, 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 and explore your knowledge. But so three, four, three, four, five, and six take the English language arts and the math and then fifth, fifth graders take the science. So it's, it's, it's a decent amount of testing that has to be done in person. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, we're, if we're, we're already starting the planning and thinking about how we can, I know the window opens March, what, 15th or something like that? And it'll, it'll end of March. And we don't have, and I also, as, as I understand it, we do not have any ELL learners, so we don't have to administer the access test, correct? Just the SBACs and, where you're not sure, or we can't probably well, play on well, the can't really the talk SU, about it. Across the SU, we have ELL. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. and we, we yeah. are administering that. Okay. Carl, that's our understanding, too, that the state's going forward with the state assessment, which is the S. We haven't talked a great deal about that. My understanding is that the window goes, uh, goes, goes longer than the end of March. I think it goes into April. No, yeah, I think the window actually goes from the goes middle of March all the way through June. Yeah, or the middle, yeah, somewhere in the middle of right. June. But so I, you know, get, organizing all that and fitting it in, I'm just it, it surprised me no. they were doing it, hoping that you guys were on top of it, and it sounds like you are excellent. The conversation we did have with staff in our um, in service in December because SBAX came up in the window. I think one of the things we've always kind of had our hands tied is like this idea of trying to rotate devices among kids since it's all computerized and how to make that work. And we don't have that gridlock anymore because all those age groups have a one-to-one -one device in the building. So we will truly be able to, like if there's some benefit to any of this right now, that's one of those things. We will be able to like not try and rush and figure out when the best time is to take that before April break, which really doesn't make sense when there's still a good chunk of prep and teaching that could happen. So we have talked about it in that capacity that we have some time to really plan and be thoughtful and purposeful about when our window is and how to prepare kids to take tests, not teaching to the test, but there is some strategy around how to take a test. Yeah, no, and that's great. I hadn't thought about the fact that our, our, our device bottleneck 
was was conveniently cured by uh, going to a one to one program. I'm sure that makes it uh, a, a lot easier to manage. Um, and yeah, I think you know, the, given that it's you know it, it's testing on the knowledge of the year, trying to do it, you know, towards the end of the window versus the beginning allows the kids really to have have have, have been exposed to the, the majority of the material. So it's just I, I'm just really glad to know you guys are are on top of it and thinking of it. Thank you. Amy, I just had a quick question um, about winter wellness. That uh, information sounds awesome. That we were able to secure um, gear for the preschoolers. I just um, I noticed that there was a group of Rochester residents that that raised funds to buy cross country skis. But then there was also uh, in your, your next paragraph you talked about Cynthia Powers getting cross country skis. So I just was wondering what the difference between the two were. I, I don't think there's any significant difference, Amy. The the ones that were fundraised for, um, I think, can, uh, can go up a, a little bit older. Cynthia is, is particularly focused on on our youngest youngs. Um, our goal is to have uh, enough equipment, and I think we're pretty close to that, so that we're uh, so that our um, model for participating in winter wellness isn't driven by a lack of equipment but instead okay. we have enough equipment so that we can organize it and schedule it in a way that makes sense. Okay, wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. Justine, do you have a comment or question for our principals? No, thank you. Good, Megan? Megan, you still with us? I, um, no, I'm good, thank you. Okay, good, Jenny? No, not right now. Okay, thank you. All right, move on to business manager. Thank you, principals. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Happy Good evening. New Year. You too. So I sent my business manager report out with the packet, so there isn't really any substantial updates other than um, we are still waiting for the auditors to complete your FY20 audit. So as soon as we have that, we will get that out to you. I haven't received any additional guidance from the Agency of Education with regard to the CRF funds and all the extensions that were made. So I don't have any update yet on that section, but as soon as I know, I will let you all know. Tara, can you just again, the acronym CRF? Coronavirus Relief Funds. Thank you. So if there's not any specific questions to my report, I'll have Ray put up your revenue and expenditure summary. Um, oh yeah, let's do that. And then I'll just go around just to make sure everybody's good with that. So some of you may have seen this when, if you came to the SU full board meeting last month where we presented this for the supervisory union. So this is updated as of your December 31st expenditures. This first page that we're looking for, looking at right now is your revenue side. So this comes straight from your mm -hmm. FY21 budget. That first column is the description the second column is the actual FY21 budget. And then we move over to the right and it gives us our FY21 projected and then the difference. So that first line, that 142,987, that was the surplus that you carried forward. The tuition was budgeted at 493,320. As Jamie had indicated earlier and as we had discussed previously, we did not receive as many tuition students as we projected. So the anticipated tuition for K through six is 361,768. It appears that we are getting more pre-K students than we budgeted for. So we got a little bit of an increase there. Interest income, we had budgeted for 500 and based on your December, your December expenditure report, we've been receiving additional interest income. So I projected additional revenue there. I don't foresee us getting any miscellaneous income at this point unless something comes in second half of the year. We're not doing the rentals that we did previously. So right now I have no projection as far as rental income. Your forestry grant, I anticipate that you'll get the full amount that they indicated we would be receiving. 
And then your trustees of public funds, I anticipate that you'll get the full 9,000. I'm not sure how that process works when you request that money down from the trustees, but so I put the $9,000 in there as well. The next section down is based on your tax revenue and what we receive from the Agency of Education. So I anticipate the property taxes that we budgeted for is what we're gonna receive. The state tech education funding, that's what the state pays to tech centers on your behalf. I anticipate that to be what they told us it was going to be. Transportation aid, we had projected 81,823. We are only going to receive 77,016. I received those numbers from the AOE already and now I'm just waiting for the actual deposit to happen and then we can get that money transferred off to you. So we'll have a short, small default, small shortfall there. The next section is on special ed and that's part of the SU. So it doesn't apply to your local revenue budget. So the last section there is your other revenue and that's your small schools grant. I anticipate that we'll get what the state told us we were going to get. And then the last line there is what you receive from the supervisory union in your sub grants, Title I Medicaid funds. And I anticipate that you'll receive what we budgeted for there as well. So Ray, if you can go to the expenditure report before I talk about this next section on the second page. Did it not come through? I'm only seeing one page. The okay, moment. Let, me let me reprint that then. Sorry about that. You should have it in your email, Ray. And I definitely do not want to rush Tara on this part, but we are at 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I talk fast. <laughs> I don't want to rush you because this is important. It's important. While we're waiting for that, I just had a quick question. I was wondering, so the tuition difference, and you may have talked about this last time I wasn't there, I apologize, but are those mostly um, do we know if those are mostly homeschool students or are there many that switch to other schools? I believe a majority of them were homeschool students. Bonnie and Lindy, is that what your recollection was too when we looked at the list in detail? Yes, yeah, sorry. No, that was several months ago for me. <laughs> yeah. So we do believe those differences, Jenny, are from those who chose to homeschool between both campuses. And this is homeschool versus virtual. Correct. Yes, because yeah, if they were you virtual, still you still would have received tuition virtual. revenue. Carl? And that's, if, if, if I do my math right, that's that's eight kids? Yes, Carl, eight kids. So this next page here, this is the expenditure side, which you need to understand before I can talk about the surplus deficit projection. So on the top line, that's your expenditure budget, all the way there on the right side of the screen. So the next section down is items that were not budgeted for. In your case, it was the COVID cost for materials, supplies, PPE, that type of stuff, which I anticipate we should be able to receive grant funding. So, but I wanted to put that there in the event that we don't receive it in full. So it's not a surprise. So today you've spent 38,286 on that. Um, items in your budget that are currently looking to be over budget, overspent based on what was budgeted for. Health insurance, it looks to be, we got about a $50,000 difference in what was budgeted for and what was actual enrollment at the beginning of the year. Just be reminded that January is our open enrollment month. So I will see any additional changes that were made as far as enrollment is concerned. Probably won't see it in the billing until February or March, but when I return to the office, during the day um, next week, I will be meeting with Lisa 
to get the summary report of who changed their insurance plans. So in your February report, I'll have an additional projection for the health insurance based on, on that as well. So Tara, and then, to be, Tara, so just to be clear, that 50,000 is uh, over what we budgeted, correct? Yes. Yeah. And Tara, this is not HRA or is this HRA? No, this is purely health insurance. This okay. is what health plan your employees picked to be on as of July 1st, or okay. if they were, if they were new hires, if they were already employed, January is our open enrollment month. Rates change July 1, enrollment changes January. And the next, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, whatever, go. whatever changes both are in this $50,000 uh, $50, um, as well as whatever changes that uh, are made um, by employees in the enrollment period, that'll all be affected in the budget that we're, that we're going to be seeing and voting on. So we'll hopefully have a, 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 a health insurance figure that's that's uh, a closer to to, to actual. In our yeah. next and we're not yes, gonna I will update the current drafts that we've worked through are based on July enrollments. So once I have that updated list from Lisa for January, then I can go in and update the enrollments, um, plan enrollments for each of the employees that are in the budget moving forward. Okay. Yeah, I just don't want us to, as we've talked about in other, in, in other issues and other uh, circumstances, sometimes by making assumptions based on last year's budget and carrying them forward, we tend to compound some of our errors. So as long as we're taking a fresh look at that and trying to use the most recent population and their most recent choices, I, I'm good with that. Absolutely. So the next line down, this is um, what needs to be paid into the Vermont State Teachers Retirement Program for any new teacher that has entered into the retirement system. This is an annual expense. It's not a one-time fee. So based on your teachers that are currently employed with you and have been employed with you, we were about $3,000 under budgeted um, versus what your actual bill came in for. So moving forward in the FY22 budget, we will also make those adjustments to make sure we're covering all of the new teachers that are within that assessment. And that is, like I said, an every year assessment and you're responsible to pay it as long as they're employed by your district. And it's about 1350 per teacher. So then the next section down is potential areas of savings. And this is very raw data right now on projections. You know, what happens when you come back to in-person could change this. Um, could increase it uh, based on what happens with COVID and all of those exciting things in our world right now. So we anticipate as of today, a projected savings in your field trip line of about $4,000 and books about 10,000, tech hardware about 10,000, and then your special programs, which is the winter wellness program because it hasn't been able to be used to fruition is about $10,000. So again, those numbers can change. We may find other areas of savings as we continue to move forward throughout the year. But this is where we project there are some savings potentially right now. Go ahead, Amy. I, oh, sorry, Ethan. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I just had a question about um, the if we were going to have any projected savings from um, not having to do maybe as large of a food service transfer because of additional funding that we we're getting um, for food service. I did not put anything in as a savings for food service transfer, but I can look at that as we move forward in the year. Because that's so a significant uh, amount is 50, I think 56,000 that we were planning and on. I'm just with the board. I mean, my hope is you'll get to, as at least in my tenure, just this number should get better, not worse, right? Like this is, these are all very conservative with the savings. And we try to project the increases as much as possible, just so you know. So I hope that these numbers get better every month. They shouldn't get worse. Well, isn't the, or isn't there a not necessarily CARES fund, but isn't there a federal food service program that is uh, providing us um, monies for food service right now? Well, it's paying for meals for each student and it's reimbursed at a higher rate. But as if you looked at the SU um, report that we did uh, back in December with Bill, we're still projecting deficits. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah. And that would be with your full 
transfer of the 56,000 because those were all taken into account in the financials that Bill had provided to the board in December. But again, okay. we'll continue to watch that and monitor that throughout the course of the year. Uh, Carl, you had your hand raised. Carl? Um, yeah, uh, and did, did, this is the same uh, assumption that, that you made at the SU meetings, uh, uh, Tara, correct? That the potential areas of savings are, are uh, the field trips that we're expecting we're not going to be able to use because of COVID versus uh, things that we're just going to cancel. Um, Correct, Carl. You know, books that were books, books that were just going to rip out of little kids' hands and send back to Scholastic. It's just we're we're canceling things that resources we don't expect that we're going to use versus versus uh, uh, trimming things that we otherwise would. Yes, so I don't think we're ripping books out of kids' hands, Carl. But yes, it's you know being cautious on the expenditures and if it's not a necessity, not doing it. Right. No, I, I, I and, and I appreciate them. I'm glad we're being proactive about this and, and not just waiting till the end of the year and going, you know, oh, well, but um, I, I also wanted to make sure that we weren't, you know, jumping the gun and necessarily, um, you know, shutting things down to try to, uh, uh, you know, fill a, fill a void that, do, that hopefully doesn't materialize. Um, yeah, other questions? Carl. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just was going to share with the board that when the budget did not pass the first time, but we were getting closer to the start of school, which meant teachers, we needed supplies, we knew these things. Bonnie and I both made the decision also based under Jamie and Tara's guidance that we're going to allow teachers X number of dollars, which was significantly less than what some of them had requested to make sure that they had things like pencils and you know those daily supplies to, so we could open school what that proved to us is that some of these budget requests that have gone in in the past not that we want to cut corners with what we're offering kids but we definitely can be a little smarter with our spending in terms of what we're purchasing so that's some of the reason you're seeing some of these surplus areas and potential areas of savings as well because We've improvised in a good way. No, the, and that's that's excellent. Thank you. I'm glad. I, I just want to make sure it's it's purposeful and and, I, and like I said, I applaud uh, you guys for all for being proactive about uh, trying to give us a, a much clearer and more transparent idea of where we are, even if it is. Yes. Bad news. I agree. Uh, Megan, do you have a question for the business manager? No, I'm okay. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, it's not really related to this um i don't know if we're going over it later but in terms of the the number of equalized pupils i believe next year it's going down by seven and i was wondering what that equates to in terms of this number of kids next year versus this year projected so as far as equalized pupil we do not have a number a specific number or a verified number from the AOE at this point in time. They gave us a working number because there are still several schools who have not filed all of their data files and there are still many adjustments that are being made and they're still working through how they're going to protect the AD, the average daily membership, the ADM that the, I don't, can't think of the name of the, the act right now, but through this, the CRF where they're going to not allow your FY21 average daily membership to fall below your FY20 average daily membership and how that will impact your equalized pupil calculation. So we're still working through that. But yes, I mean, a, a drop of seven in your equalized pupil also takes into the weighting that impacts and calculates your equalized pupil. So that that's where we're looking right now. So that number is not finalized yet. Okay. In terms of the talk about like the adjustments that they're looking at, does that have any do virtual students do they essentially count the same or is that um, so those are yes, the they're they're being counted in your average daily membership as they would be if they're in your building. Yeah. Because their their attendance is taken by the Virtual Learning Academy and reported to the individual schools that that student is a student of. Have there been any issues with um, 
I know just because my daughter is in the virtual and I know that there's one teacher that um, seems to have had some issues with kids not showing up to classes. Um, are there are there issues, are there any concerns about you know these students not coming to class or are they pretty much you know I guess what I'm saying is are the numbers dropping you know are kids not showing up or not working out well? Jenny, that, they wouldn't that wouldn't affect your your equalized pupil. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure if they weren't you know they weren't counted or something like that. Uh, what would affect us? But they held us harmless was folks who homeschool. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. All set, Jenny? Yep. Good. Thank you. Um, uh, I have one more question, and we don't need to answer it tonight. I would just love to see a breakdown at some point for what the 36000 in COVID expenses went toward. Um, just because that is obviously, and we're hoping it all gets paid back, but it just would be nice to know um, a breakdown. Is that available? Do we have that information? I can give you the detail from that expenditure line. Yeah, I mean, as I say, it doesn't have to be tonight, it could be February, but I just, just so I know, you know where, where, that, where that chunk of money is going. Would that be good? Yep. Great. That's a simple report I'll just generate. It'll be an Excel file that I'll send to you from the system. Great, thank you. Sarah, going forward, I know that this, this was the first time that this board had seen this new format, but going forward, will you be sending this report to us in the packet prior to the meeting? Yes, Amy, I will be. Thank you. Great, yeah, I, I appreciate this very much, this new format, thank you. Welcome. Um, any further questions for business manager? No, okay. Very good. Thank you for the reports. Let us go to our first public comment. And I will go to our list. So just so you know, we may not have um, an answer for your question, but we will entertain any comment. Please to recognize, identify yourself and the town you're from. And uh, um, give, your, give your comment or question. Um, we will definitely take notes on them and I will work down the list and uh, just to the, those people calling in, it's star six to unmute and I'll give you a little extra time. And, you know, sometimes we have some hearing um, issues, so we will work through that. Um, and just uh, board members, if we can all be muted while this is happening, if everybody can be muted, just so we have as little distraction as possible. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, starting down here, I have an unverified call. Ray, is that Orca? Unverified caller? I don't know what an unverified caller is or how to identify them, so I'm going to move on. Uh, Barb DeHart, do you have a, uh, a comment at this point in the meeting? Yes, no. Hi. Uh, no, it's, I don't at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Uh, we'll move on down to Charity Colton. Charity, do you have a comment at this point in the meeting? Uh, just two quick things. Um, mm -hmm. One, a question about the winter wellness cross-country ski equipment thing. Is that, you guys mentioned Rochester, but is that something for all of Rochester Stockbridge? Is that just intended for the Rochester kiddos? Um, Bonnie shaking her head. Yes, everybody. Yes. Um, um, it just sounds like it was gathered together by a group of Rochester people. Um, and then the other question I had, or guess concern I'd like to hope that they would add in is when it comes to the shop rental piece, uh, I would just like to make sure that everyone takes into consideration that there's a whole lot of activity going on with the high school building and that if something were to happen before it sold, then how do you make sure that any rental agreement is clearly delineated that here's what activity would happen, how that all would pan out, because you'd end up with two possible different rental contracts. And that also people are thinking and considering whatever the group is that's going to be using it, how the impact of extra people, extra cars, what their 
uh, daily practices are going to be going in and out of the building. Um, how could impact the kiddos that are in the Rochester facility for school purposes. Um, I didn't hear anyone mention any of that. So just things to think about, in my opinion. That's it for me. Thank you, Charity. Uh, Dune Hendricks, do you have a comment for the board? Nope, I'm, I'm just here to listen and learn. Thank you. Thank you, Dune. Uh, moving on, Janet Whitaker. Do you have a comment for the board? Um, nope, I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne Mills, do you have a comment for the board? You there, Joanne? Oh, I just saw your mic go off and on again. Oh, sorry, we had this problem last meeting. Joanne, uh, if you drop off and come back, that may help. Okay, I think that's what we did last time. I'll, I'll certainly get back to you, Joanne. Just let us know when you're here. Karen, Karen Rubin, please. Do you have a comment for the board? No, Ethan, I'm all set. Thank you very much for everything you guys do. Thank you. Much appreciated. Cricket, I know you're here for the building meeting. Cricket McCusker, do you have a comment for the board? No, I'm all set. Thanks, Ethan. Thank you. Uh, Pat Harvey, do you have a comment for the board? No comment. Thank you. Rob Gardner, comment for the board? Nope. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Tim Pratt, do you have a comment for the board? No, nope, thanks. Good, thank you. Uh, and now I'm into the numbers, so I'll, I'll give the best I have. 518 star star 31. Please identify yourself, star 6 to unmute. Again, 518 star star 31. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, seven seven four five nine. Oh, I think I just saw Joanne come back. Um, I don't know. Can you um, hear me? Yes. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, well, five nine. Let's finish you and the Joanne. Okay. Just stay there. We'll get to you in just a sec. Okay. Yes. Uh, five nine. Please identify yourself. <laughs> this is Eileen Sintas. I'm good. Thanks. Good. Okay. Thank you very much, Eileen. Yes, Joanne, go ahead. Please. I think I think I need a new uh, iPad or something. Um, I don't have um, any because we haven't really talked about um, the meat and potatoes of this meeting yet. So I think that there's going to be a lot more comments um, be after we talk about the articles and um, other information. So I don't read this moment, but I will later. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, 802 star star one nine. Your star six to unmute. Please identify yourself if you have a comment. Hi, Greg Piccarello, Stockbridge. No comment right now. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Greg. 802 star star three eight star six to unmute. Please identify yourself if you have a comment. Hi, Ethan. It's Keith over in Stockbridge. Uh, just Keith. listening for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, 802 star star four five. Please star six to unmute if you have a comment. Nope, okay, we'll move on. 802 star star five three, star six to unmute if you have a comment. Hi, this is Vic Rubato in Rochester. Hi Vic. Hi, so I, I do have a uh, a couple of questions. I thought this would be a good time to pose them as opposed to after the meat of the discussion comes up. And that is that I'm, I'm very concerned about the prospect of dissolving the merger and uh, would uh, like to just pose a couple of questions very briefly uh, leading into the discussion. And first of all, um, as I understand it, some of our neighbors in Stockbridge have already pulled the trigger to initiate dissolution and are working to see that happen. So 
why is the board working on amending the articles of agreement uh, when um, there's already movement to go down that road of dissolution? So if someone could explain that in the discussion, that would be helpful. Secondly, um, will the uh, discussion tonight about the impact on the school tax uh, to both towns uh, if the merger is dissolved? And then uh, thirdly, I'd also be interested in uh, whether there is an opportunity cost, both economic and academic, uh, if the merger is dissolved. In other words, uh, what missed opportunities uh, might there be, uh, both to taxpayers and to the children of both towns. Um, so those are my questions, and hope uh, those will be addressed sometime during the discussion tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vic. Uh, very good, star star eight five. Um, star six to unmute if you have a comment. Uh, no comment at this time. Okay, thank you. And finally, 802 star star nine one. No comment. Okay, thank you. All right, let's move on to discussion items. Uh, seven one, Stockbridge decoupling information and related materials, budget, tax sheets, etc. And I believe Jamie, is this yours? Yeah. So uh, Ray, will you project the document? I'm going to go over the uh, memo that I sent out to um, the Rochester Select Board Chair um, and. Um, town clerk, and then also to the RSUD board. And I added a line on this as well tonight that I want to walk folks through. So there's tax sheets that will correspond with this and we'll get them posted um, that so folks can see that, you know, where these numbers came from and how they break down the tax sheet that you're used to seeing in your town books. This will also be printed in the town book for um, Stockbridge because that's where the vote will be held in March. And there will also be informational meetings. Um, to speak to all these numbers um, prior to the vote in March. Um, and so right now, currently in Rochester Stockbridge, you have a total expense line of four million three seven one nine five that's nine hundred fifty. Your per pupil spending is eighteen thousand seven five five point five four. I want to make certain folks realize this takes into account all projected revenues like we went over, tuition, uh, federal grants, and other local grants that you receive um, after expenses and then run through by your equalized pupil. And that's how you come out with your per pupil spending. The tax rate currently right now in Rochester is 1.5155. And in Stockbridge, it's 1.6538. I'm gonna jump down um, to the third uh, row now and talk about what would it cost for Stockbridge to be under the excess spending threshold. That would be a budget of 1,607,513. This is a new line that I put in there. I thought it was important for folks in Stockbridge to know, um, what, you know what would the expense line be after you figure in all local revenues uh, received, federal grants that we would project, and this is all based on the current 2021 projected revenues and expenses for each building in campus. We broke it down both by FTE, salary and benefits, and uh, based on function codes of what it costs to run each building. So if you came in with a 1.607513, that's a decrease of current budgeted expenditures of Stockbridge by 27016. And that would get you under the per pupil spending, which would be 18,756 and a tax rate of 1.6935, um, which is about four cents, just so folks know. So if Stockbridge was standalone, that's what that would be. What is the equivalent of about $270,000 in cuts? It's about 3.5 FTEs. And that's based on average salary with benefits is right around 80,000. We budget, that's about what we look at. When you think about salary and benefits for a 1.0 FTE of a licensed professional. 
If you look at Stockbridge with complete choice pre-K-12, and what we figured there was six pre-K students and an additional 40 elementary students that would be tuitioned out. We kept your current tuitioned middle and high school students in that budget currently for this year. So that would be 1,511,450 in total expenses. That would be a per pupil spending of 19,802.77. That is over the excess penalty threshold, but there's no penalty when you tuition out. And that would be a tax rate of 1.7881. And then the top one is Stockbridge as of current staffing this year. That is 1.877529. That it includes a penalty then. And when you go over the penalty threshold, it's a buck for a buck. So you quickly race up. And that's where you come up with a per pupil spending of 25,660.47 and a tax rate of 2.3170. For Rochester, if Stockbridge was to decouple, you have a projected expenditure line of current budget this year of $2,536,048. That also puts you into the penalty threshold. That puts you in at 2125. That's $21,250.36. That includes, though, all the projected tuitions received for, as revenue for um, Granville Hancock students that you receive. I want you to also know, though, we did figure in for Stockbridge the tuition received from some students. What was that? Could you repeat some that? Some students received, uh, yeah, uh, from uh, Pittsfield. I apologize. Pittsfield. Mm hmm um, and so what that puts Rochester at is a tax rate of 1.7583. Ray, will you scroll up? Or maybe you didn't, are you able to scroll up, Ray, or did you just cut that part out? And if you did uh, that. You said that's you just fine, wanted. That's fine. That's fine. You just did. No, no, I have it ready. Do you want okay. it? Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to start on page two. Jamie. Go up. Jamie. Yeah. Jamie. Could you also um, uh, let us know why you did these figures, who asked for them? Yeah. And I'm going to have Tara jump in and let you know what would need to be decreased from the Rochester budget to also get you under the threshold. But I wanted to just show you, these are based on figures of the current 2021 budget, because that's a real budget that we know. And so we based it on your current budget, your current projected expenditures, your current projected revenues. And these figures um, also include the SU assessment broke out. So the SU assessment for both the supervisory union offices and special ed uh, were broken out into these figures. And Stockbridge was assessed at 4.6% and Rochester at 6.5. It's based on your ADM. And in uh, one of the scenarios, it's also based on enrollment. Um, it's figured in with ADM. Uh, if you keep going down, Ray, um, you know, I'll just, I'll add that, uh, again, with complete school choice, we budgeted at six pre-K and 40 elementary tuitions for Stockbridge. And you may say, well, why did you do it that way? Well, I, uh, Ethan has met with the Stockbridge Select Board. Um, and these figures were requested. Um, and also, I met with the Stockbridge Select Board, and these figures were requested. And so these figures and tax sheets with this memo will go into the town book. Um, and so there will also be an informational meeting that will go on in Stockbridge prior to the vote in March. And then there will be a vote in March in regards to whether or not there be an affirmative vote to decouple from the merger. I want to remind everyone, if that vote is an affirmative, then it would go and there'd be a request of the Rochester Select Board to warn a meeting. There is not a timeline on that. That's a misunderstanding in statute. So there will be, I got that clarified by Donna Russo-Savage earlier this week, because we're currently 
going through this same process in the first branch unified district with Umbridge and Kelsey. And so then it would go to Rochester. There'd be a vote in Rochester. And then at that point, if there's an affirmative vote in Rochester to decouple, it would then go to the state board for approval. The state board really at that point's decision is what are the assets that need to change hands and make certain that we're whole financially across the two districts. And then they would decide when the operation would take place for operation. Meanwhile, more likely than not, based on the timing, um, they would look at potentially fiscal year July 1, 22. Um, potentially, um, it would depend on the timing of the decoupling and that, you know, as, uh, if this rolled out and the state board approved it, much like when you merged, there would be an R sub, but, uh, district board continuing to maintain operations for that current year. And then a separate Stockbridge and Rochester district board preparing budgets for the year ahead. Uh, Tara, can you let uh, the board know what Rochester would need to cut to get under the threshold? You would need to cut $151,241 from your expenditures, which equates to about 1.89 FTEs. And by doing that, it would get you right to the threshold and the tax rate would after CLA would be 1.5519. Okay, Jamie, are you complete? I'm good. I think Carl had his hands up. Yep, I'm just gonna work my way through. Carl, go ahead. Um when you split up transportation, uh Tara, did you just do it? Did you just cut it in half, or did you look at the actual uh, uh, Stockbridge and Rochester um, numbers? Because as I recall, when the contract was was uh, last revised and bid out, when you looked at the town's costs, uh, Stockbridges were disproportionately high compared to- I used what was in the contract for each individual town. Okay, so then then, then you are using the, the, uh, the Butler numbers. Thank you. What are the Butler numbers, Carl? I'm sorry, Butler is the bus company. And so right. she's, using the actual, she, she's using the actuals from the contract and not just taking a percentage or just chopping it in half. And just so folks know, I mean, part of the issue uh, with both our towns is, is that our equalized pupils are dropping. If you look at your expenditures, um, an example in, in Stockbridge, if you look at uh, back in 17, you know, the expenditures was 1.7 and change. Um, it was 1.736707. The issue is, as our equalized pupils have dropped, we haven't reduced staffing and or budgets to keep up with that. And I mean, that is the issue across the state, right? And so I said to the select board um, in Stockbridge, I'm very concerned about the trajectory in general if we continue to do business the same way we've done it. And so, you know, what I've, I said this to First Branch last night, and I, I say it to our sub, we have merged in governance, but we haven't merged strategically in other ways to find efficiencies and or deliver the promise on additional programs. And so both, I, I, I find there, it, it, it's clear to me, I've got two districts in very similar positions at the same time, and the problem looks to be the same. There's a merger, but we haven't promised on efficiencies, nor have we changed the amount of programming we provide kids and or differentiated it. We kept doing business the same way. And so I just, I'll end with that. And I, you know, I, what I say is to me, the fact that we're at this position is a mandate that we have to look strategically at how we do business. Is it sustainable and how do we move forward to benefit kids. Further questions? Spin around here again. Uh, Amy? Uh, Megan? Hi, um, I have a question about 
if we were to uncouple, was there any clarity on what would be the status of our small schools grants being the same, reduced? I know that was part of uh, the reason to merge was that it would maintain our small schools grant, the level that we were prior um, to the merge. And if we did not, that it would be then reduced. And I just wondered if there was any clarity on that subject. So uh, the information received from the AUE on that is, is that we could apply for you year to year. The criteria is a little more stringent and there's no guarantee, but it, it is still available. So if you were to decouple, there's an opportunity to apply. Like I said, there's different criteria around it and it's a year to year application. Could you please let us um, know, just so we all know what those small schools grant numbers are, please, for each town that each town brings in? Well, I can tell you what you brought in for ARSA. We haven't broken that apart, but for ARSA, Tara, it was just on that revenue projection. Yep, let me just open it back up. I just barely closed the screen. And Megan, and there's no guarantee what we would bring in because it will change based on oh, the I, application. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm very well aware. It's, yeah. it's, it's only grandfathered while we're merged, correct? Same with the same with the project with with the protections on on uh, average daily ma membership student count dropping, correct? Uh, that's or is, is, is student count dropping. Well, phantom students are totally gone from the yeah. equation in general. Um, so they're off the books. The current small schools grant is 237,671. Total. But you so don't have the breakdown. Right I can't tell you what that is broken. It's not broken down by town. It is only purely issued to the district. And on okay. the cash flows that we get from the agency of education, it doesn't even reflect on the individual town's cash flows. It only reflects on the RSA district cash flow. Well, we could potentially go back to the, the prior budget when we were on um, individual districts and see what our small schools grant was at that time. And it should be about the same. Yes. No. I don't I, I don't have a comment on it yet because we reached out to the AOE to ask that question and we didn't get a response yet. So when I get that, okay. response, I'm happy to provide it. I just I don't want to misspeak. OK, thank you, Jenny. Yeah, I have three comments. Um, the first one you mentioned, um, um, I forget what my train of thought was, but I think another difference between the, the two towns is the amount of revenue that we bring in. I don't think you had mentioned that. I don't know what the numbers are on top of my head, but I know that um, Rochester receives a significantly higher um, revenue from tuition students in Stockbridge. Um, the second thing is I was wondering if the small school grant was assumed that, that those would be received in those numbers. And then the third No, we thing, didn't we did not we took the small school grant out because we didn't feel like there was any guarantee with that. Okay. And then kind of furthering up, I agree on the the efficiencies that Jamie mentioned. I know that's one thing that I um, make sure to mention every year. You know, we're starting to define staffing with the, um, I believe the art teacher and the music teacher and some efficiencies with, I know Janet Whitaker is doing, I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong, Wendy, but, you know, doing some bulk ordering and stuff like that. But I think that's one big thing that um, I think every year that's something that we need to look on or what, what efficiencies can we have between the two? The other one, Jenny, is guidance. We share guidance between yeah, the two. Yeah, yeah, I knew I was forgetting one. Mm -hmm. So, next. Jenny, we budgeted your tuition revenues at the students you currently have. So we took the number of students you currently have in Stockbridge, that's tuition, and in Rochester, and that's the revenue in this projection we budgeted. Right. Jenny, is that Isn't it true that the, the, the end outcome of the – um, so your your chart showed that um, if we were to unmerge, that Stockbridge would have a higher tax rate than Rochester. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think a portion of that piece is that Rochester receives a lot higher revenue than than Stockbridge does. Well, it's that, but it's also based on you know. Don't forget when you look at tax rates, 
your towns are never going to be equal because it's based on when the latest appraisal was. Right. Yeah. There's that piece too. Yeah. So that's that tax rates figured out through the CLA after it's divided by through with that. So that's, those tax sheets will demonstrate that. You'll see. Hold on. That. Yeah. Uh, I uh, just want to get my word in here a sec. Uh, uh, numbers you're using, Jamie, are those COVID numbers or are those populations pre-COVID? Those are your equalized pupils that were based on this budget year pre-COVID. Your equalized you. pupils this year were pre-COVID. Thank you. I just Carl, want did you have another comment? Oh, and then I'll get to Amy. Yeah, I, I was just going to point out, you can see the impact of the CLA in that first line, the combined RSUD, Rochester Stock, Stockbridge District line, where you see that with the, 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 the unified per pupil spending of 18755 cents that Rochester pays a buck 51 and Stockbridge pays a buck 65. And that's a direct uh, effect of the fact that Stockbridge, Stockbridge's CLA is right around 100%. And Rochester's is around 110 or so. Good. Amy? I just wanted to confirm what I heard that this column of tax rate is um, after the CLA is applied. That is the, the your bottom line tax rate. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because I felt like that's the most important, right? Like that's, yes, I, that's I the agree. big number. Justine, do you have any comment? No, thank you. I'm good. Okay. Any further comment <clears throat> for this um, on this item? All right. There being none, let's move on to 7 2 COVID 19 and impact on our side. <clears throat> so, I mean, I'll, I'll kick it off by saying that. Um, you know, you prepare to uh, have in-person learning, you prepare for virtual learning, you prepare for the event that you have positive cases of COVID-19, and then you have them, and then you learn. Now, I will say, I feel um, lucky that we weren't one of the first folks dealing with this, because we were able to learn from other folks' mistakes in the past. I'll say that I'm proud of how hard we worked on it. I'll say, do, were there things that we've learned? Absolutely. We tried really hard to communicate in a timely manner. I will tell you the holidays were not perfect around this um, because you know we had to navigate this with some delayed testing, which I know is frustrating for folks, and uh, working with the Department of Health. And they were really responsive and we met with them daily, uh, but their ability and capacity to update numbers in real time is not at a capacity level that it needs to be. Um, and I will also say, that all contact tracing falls on schools. That is the reality. They sit down and they meet with us, but your team here in RSUD were forced to do contact tracing. And I know in the past, Secretary French and the governor has said that they do it. They do not do it. And I'm not trying to be you know, difficult or demeaning with that, but I will say, that it's clear to us that we have to train ourselves up to be really good at this. Now, I will tell you, I think we got really good with it by day three, but making line list and making certain that we help folks identify what are close contacts and what are the first onset of symptoms and helping folks define that, that all fell on your school personnel. The Department of Health contact tracers called much later than we did. And so, I will tell you that the Department of Health, by all indications, has said we did a great job. We got a, everyone in the community was unbelievably cooperative. They went and got tested. They quarantined after being contacted. Um, and I will tell you that that's not the experience in every community. There's been other communities in the state where folks did not cooperate with the, you know, the request to get tested. But you should be proud that your communities did. And so um, I just wanted to kick off with that and then turn it over to Lindy and let her talk to you about um, some additional points of emphasis as we move forward. I know there was a question about um, whether or not we're going to reopen for in-person. I'm not making any decisions around that for the district. So later this week, we have surveillance testing on staff on Wednesday. 
The assumption is we're opening, but we've been out of school since the 18th and I am dealing with positive cases across the SU right now that are not school cases, but community contracted cases. We, the cases now popping up are not school related. These are community related cases. They are spread in our communities right now. And so we're navigating that and the decision about whether or not we reopen will be based on data around community spread. I'm meeting with the Department of Health again on Friday. I'm gonna talk about this with them and what the data is showing them. And based on our surveillance testing over the weekend. Um, and so on Friday, I'll give everyone an update across the SU about which buildings will be opening for in-person based on that data and based on you know staffing levels and things of that nature. Um, and then in a, a meeting with the Department of Health, but know that this could adjust over the weekend after surveillance testing comes in. I don't expect, and I'm going to address this in my letter, I don't expect sur surveillance testing from staff to come in until Saturday or Sunday. And so then at that point, I may be forced, if I don't have staffing levels um, to open for in-person, to go virtual in certain schools. Um, so this is not ideal. It's the first time we're facing it. We've been unbelievably lucky. I will tell you that I was in Stockbridge School on the 18th of December for over an hour um, reading with students. And I was very pleased with what I saw for procedures. I think that there's never enough due diligence. Uh, we are doing deep cleaning of the school. I'll let Lindy talk to you about the procedures we're increasing across the two campuses and SU wide. Um, again, from beginning, I said, all these practices mitigate risk. They never were going to take this from being able to be passed. <laughs> and the Department of Health has been clear about that. And, you know, I've tried to use that word mitigating risk from day one. But I think that, you know, this is just a wake up call that that's the reality. It's an unbelievably contagious virus. And we try to mitigate risk. And when we use mitigating factors, I was in that building, like I said, over an hour, and I was fine. I wasn't, you know, there was no issues for me. But, you know, I understand that folks are worried and have concerns. And so I want Lindy to address all the other additional things that we're doing um, based on just, you know, an ability to stop and reflect. I'm happy that we had the plan we had to pause this week because, you um, I'd be, I would have multiple schools probably based on community spread, potentially going down virtually anyway. So I'm glad we had this plan proactively to hit the pause button to see what the data did mm -hmm. <clears throat> because there is some community spread going on right now across our towns. Lindy, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, so I also just wanna share, um, Shane Oaks, who is our WRVSU COVID coordinator, is my new best friend, I think, in all this. I don't mean to laugh, but um, we're very fortunate because between himself and our school nurse, they hopped right on contact tracing. And I know for a fact people put some plans on hold to do the responsible and safe thing to ensure that they weren't part of the spread within our community. So I just wanna, I can't say thank you to those people enough because that's not an easy phone call to make especially early on when we're still learning all the ins and outs of what goes with it in terms of quarantining and things like that um as you know we have had five associated um cases that are connected to school and um we are aware of other cases that are going on within our community we have not they have not been deemed yet as cases that were transmitted at school. And I just wanna share, I know there was some pushback that it felt like there needed to be more information out there. It is not an instantaneous information process when you're going through this. Everything is very much an educated guess based on people testing positive and their onset of symptoms, like Jamie said, and counting backwards and figuring out contact lists. And it's, um, I know people felt like maybe we weren't as transparent as possible. It's not that we were trying to hide things. We just didn't have factual information to put out. And some of that had to do with the holiday. That being said, 
like Jamie said, I've been with the Department of Health now pretty much every day since Tuesday uh, 22nd, other than Christmas and maybe New Year's. But um, that being said, it's also created a great time for reflection and how to tighten things up. Some things that popped right away of things we can get better at because we can always be better in our practice and everything we do. And it's important we're keeping people as safe as possible is one thing that I've noticed. And Bonnie spoke to this earlier is that um, we're not outside as much because of the cold weather. We're not outside as a community. We're not outside at home. We're not outside in a lot of places as much because of the colder weather. So today during a staff meeting, we spoke about the need that within every hour, you need to be outside for 10 to 15 minutes. That does mean kids are gonna leave boots and snow pants on for a while because that process, depending on the age group, and I'm, I've seen sixth graders take a while to get ready, um, could, could be time consuming, but it's important that we're getting out we're breaking up that stale air situation and we're spending more time outside. There's nothing wrong with some fresh air. It seems to be very beneficial. That was one glaring thing when you look at our schedule before vacation versus when we started school. Um, so that's one area we talked about. We also talked about as a staff tightening up, like check your six is what I call it um, because are you truly six feet away? I think we assume, oh yeah, this is about six feet. But when you're together all day with the same group of people, except for about an hour and change, you're going to be considered an exposure. Even if you have masks on the right way, which we all did. I just want to reassure that um, piece of information. Everybody was wearing masks. The it truly just, it's a very contagious virus. And so um, really we talked about how to do that. So when you're doing a reading group, is everybody really six feet? And having to measure that out. There's something to be said about that. It's okay to let kids talk a little louder because the mask might muffle things and we're a little further away. Um, so that's one area we're really emphasizing and six feet from each other as adults. We're all craving this social interaction and it happens and you get a little bit closer and you get a little bit closer and then all of a sudden you're not really six feet. And so talking about areas that we saw that happen, it happens at the copier, the world famous copy machine. You see someone at the copier and you're chatting away. So nope, you got to turn around, go wait your turn in your room, come back. If it's something immediate, we'll try and help you as quickly as possible. Um, also, our main office is not big enough to be for anybody to be six feet from Miss Janet, um, myself included. So she will, not very excitedly, but we will be keeping her door closed and knocking and using like, you know, put something in her mailbox just things of those interactions and basis. We had already moved our staff meetings to virtually, even though we were all in the same building, we weren't meeting in one spot. Um, I'm trying to think other things. Like Jamie spoke to, we our um, custodian is coming in and doing extra cautious deep cleaning in each classroom. And then we're gonna work with Rochester and use the fogger to have it fo each room fogged. Um, and then the other big area is from 1.30 to 3, we've been doing these enrichment intervention blocks. And I'm working with Carrie McDonald and Blythe Bates about um, that just seems like a big area where people are kind of converging all together. So instead, we're going to have adults kind of move to the kids. Um, and I think that was easy enough to do in the fall to have people to converge to one spot and combine pods because we were we're small and we're under 20 kids when we do that, but we are also going right outside and we were going class by class and it was taking, you know, there was a lot of spread. So there's ways to do that better and just managing. Um, we do have two groups that have to use the hallway bathrooms. If you're familiar with Stockbridge, just managing that a little bit better. Cause like I said, people are kids and you know kids and adults are craving some social interaction and we just really need to try and do that and then our hand washing 
and mask wearing can always be better. And what I mean by mask wearing is just really working with families to make sure you, every kid has an appropriately fitted mask. Sometimes kids are coming in with masks too big, um, things like that. Also, um, after people eat, it's recommended that because masks come off, that kids and adults clear the space for 20 minutes, like go outside and allow surfaces to be wiped down again. So that is something, so we have some scheduling adjustments that we're working on to help tighten some of this up. Um, and also just the, the other piece we really reviewed is I think people, I know people got complacent mm -hmm. and not that we were violating anything, but doing a really good job of, um, oh, I always get headaches. That's my baseline. So I don't need to check it off on the health screening form. And we, if you are honest with yourself, we all do it. I, I'm guilty of it. I'll be the first one to tell you. I think I've had a headache since March 13th. So I'm not really sure how I'm supposed to differentiate. But we need to be honest about that because we owe it to each other. We're asking families to do it and adults need to do it too. So we reviewed all of those today in a staff meeting. And we will meet again on Friday. And we're just trying to answer questions and let people know that it's safe, as safe as it can be. First off, Lindy, thank you. You're welcome. You, you didn't have much of a vacation. Um, I'm pushing for a no vacation mode because I'm now convinced that they just don't exist right now. So yeah. maybe we should just push on through. But that's a different conversation. Um, what's the standard? I mean, why not, while it's cold, stay in a virtual? Now, obviously, there's pushback from the parents on that. Um, but it does, it is a big difference. I mean, obviously it's a big difference when you have the cold and it's harder to be outside. And we haven't even seen the real cold yet. You know, we've actually had a pretty mild, um, October, November, December. Um, so I, I guess, I guess what is the standard we're going by for the balance between good academics in person versus safety. And it seems like safety these days has to be first. And I guess I'm not still clear on, you know, even what Jamie's saying, what is the, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the tipping point? Well, I mean, the tipping point is, do we have community spread, right? And so if I feel like we've got community spread going on, I very well may decide we just have to hit the pause button. If we don't have data showing we have community spread within towns, within the SU, that it's, a, you know, we have, I mean, cause that's the nice thing. The Department of Health can tell us where is their community spread occurring. And so if we don't have community spread occurring, then I feel comfortable that we can open. If we have community spread, that's where I think we have to consider are we pausing in certain towns and or, you know, certain areas of the SU. And so that's what I'm going to be navigating on top of, do we have staffing or do we have current cases? So those are the data points. Um, in general, you know, the why during the cold months, if we can safely come back, it's, you know, as everyone has said, as far as the American Pediatrics Association and, you know, the governor and the secretary of ed, we know specifically elementary students need that social emotional learning and academics in person to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And what I can tell you is that the virtual learning and the data collected in that, and we're gonna have another data point here soon this next month, we've been able to stop regression, but the rate of growth is significantly lower than in person. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm concerned about is, is losing you know, more learning and potentially have students falling back a year, year and a half academically um, because you know the SU board will get data comparing the growth for virtual learners versus in person it's the virtual teaching those teachers are working unbelievably hard unbelievably hard but the growth that we're realizing is just not there mm -hmm. what what is the administration doing to help the virtual students to 
keep moving forward as much as they can. Danny, yeah, I mean, we have outfitted full staff. We didn't go with a third party vendor. We try to make certain that interventionists are in place. I mean, it's, it's why we do in-person teaching. You know, I think that this, and it's not just us here, across the country, across the state, the data for virtual learning just is demonstrating the growth is not there. It's not the same. Well, I, I, do, I do think that some teachers, just knowing personally from listening to my daughter's classes, that there's definitely some teachers that are better than this at others. And are we making sure that not only the in-person per, in staff are getting what they need, but the virtual teachers are, are getting that as well? Lindy, do you want to address that? Yep, absolutely. So Jenny, the just like the in-person staff, the virtual teachers are invited to all the same trainings, participating in all the same trainings, and we meet weekly as a staff. And um, I want to say like decipher it. I'm not sure that's the right word, but that's the eight o'clock word. Um, all that training. How does that training of what, how you would do that in person, how do you do that virtually? And I've spent just as much time observing virtual classes as I have um, observing in-person classes and doing evaluations and providing feedback. And I would have to say the feedback and the observation is more in depth with the virtual teachers because they've learned a lot and how to improve. But something, you know, you're trying to respect screen time as well with kids. And that means some independent work time. And when you do independent work time in school, there is an adult pushing and making sure that we're on track and in the right direction. And while a lot of kids take advantage of those independent work times and office hours to check in and get that additional support, there's also kids that don't. And then it becomes a, like, how much can you handle at home situation to make sure kids are on top of it. But we are working really, really hard with our virtual staff to continue and try and make sure there is as much growth as possible. For students that I guess might need more of a push than um, than other students are the the teachers reaching out, you know, reaching out to the parents because I feel like sometimes it's not necessarily the students' fault. It's you know they might need to help if the parents not there to help them. Right. Yep. There's been lots of communication um, with families, and like you kind of mentioned earlier in one of your comments, like what about those that you know, you're overhearing haven't shown up in a while. Um, with report cards, we've reached out to families that were concerned about that this is not a good learning environment for, and we need to come back to the drawing table because we're concerned. And I, I definitely do acknowledge that there's been improvements, um, you know, just listening into my daughter's um, classrooms about, you know, organization of, you know, some are naturally better at it than others, but over the course of the year, you know, there's definitely, um, I can attest that, you know, there's been improvements with, you know, organization of teachers and, and stuff like that. So I think that that's good. Great. I mean, one of the other things we do, and Jamie made it very clear right from the beginning, though Lindy is the administrator of the virtual academy, all the administrators in the district, Jamie made it very clear that our youngsters who went to virtual academy are still our youngsters. So we do things like make parent calls. In fact, I have to make one tomorrow. We follow up with, there have been some, there are some situations, though I'm glad to say not too many, but there have been situations where families and or youngsters haven't taken virtual learning as seriously as they should. So in a couple of cases, we've got some pretty high absentee rates and um, the, the school principals um, have taken on the responsibility of following up, having those conversations with parents, stressing how important it is. So we're, I guess the best way to describe what we're doing is we're trying to support from afar. And Lindy knows that all she has to do is call any one of us and whatever the job is, we'll, we'll pick it up and do it. Great, I just want to give you a time check, 22 minutes. Thank you. Um, further, further questions, Jenny, do you have more? No, I think that's good. I think that's good to hear it just, you know, I think it's getting better as the years go at the as the years gone on, but I've definitely, you know, overheard students not, you know, not knowing how to open something or not knowing how to find something. And, you know, it's not, you know, it shouldn't be on the staff to do all of that, but I just wanted to make sure that that was happening. Good. 
Thank you. Justine, you had your hand up. Yes, I wanted to ask Lindy, first off, it, it's an amazing feat what you've been going through and having to think on your feet and all of the staff and everybody. It's just, you know, I, I think it's amazing and I, can, I feel for it having worked in schools and I feel for you. And I wanted to ask, um, because the contact tracing was kind of like something you really had to think on your feet about, what was the most challenging thing? thing that that you feel you might need help with in the contact tracing piece of that experience we may see it again it might get worse is there anything you'd like to report to the board as being a challenge and um, something we might be able to help with or work on oh good question um i really have to think on that i I just can't praise Stockbridge community and families enough. People picked up the phone on unknown numbers, really acted. There's a script. I mean, Jane and Shane did a lot of the tough part and it's learning as we go. Um, I think the piece to share is if you think someone is a contact, assume they're a contact. Um, that's, I can't think of any support we need. It, it definitely, I don't recommend it happening over a holiday. Like if I could pick all over again, it makes it tough. You know, you're, you're waiting on things to come back. It seems like it's a really long period of time um, because you're waiting. And, you know, I feel there's some, there's some community members who receive phone calls on Christmas day. Like that's, that's tough. Um, but I'm really, I just can't reiterate how proud I am of how quickly we jumped on stuff. I know for a fact that people, like Jamie said, people received phone calls from our contact tracing on what steps they need to take. And it is pretty guided, Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, but the script is pretty guided from the Department of Health of what you need to share with families. And, okay, you got to check your email. And this is what um, your next steps are for day seven and day 14, however you choose to handle that as a household. Um, almost 48 hours before phone calls were made by the Department of Health in some situations. So, and we, we made contact within two hours of the first known uh, member testing positive. Wow. With everybody on people's line lists. So, um, I'm just really proud of that because I feel like it stopped. Hopefully, it seemed like it, uh, some spread. So um, I can't think of anything in the board. I just would always encourage, I know we're very small towns and it's really hard to try and keep the who out of this and who wants to finger point and do stuff. It's, it's an emotional roller coaster that people experience. Just always encourage them to get back to us or to reach out if you're getting odd questions from the community about it specifically, because there is a lot of like FERPA and health rules going on with this at the same time. Good. Carl, you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> actually, Lindy uh, just stole some of my thunder. I was uh, I, I was going to to say that we all should maybe, and I'm, I don't know that we we need to wordsmith this now, but but you know, getting uh, some talking points from from uh, Jamie or whatever that's consistent across the SU of how to say that I can't, t you know, yup, there's some COVID in our schools. I can't say much more because our school is small and people have have privacy rights and protections. Um, so, you know, perhaps perhaps giving uh, all, all the board members, uh, you know, some basic talking points about how to to handle that and how to, to, to redirect people to either the principal, the, the building principals, or to uh, to, to to Jamie um, about that because I worry sometimes that. You know, as we've seen, you know, sometimes fragmented responses or, or different people saying different things can can be an issue. And mm -hmm. what concerns me then just as the, the, you know, the continuity of education piece, which is my second point, um, I think it's, I think one of the things that we really need to take away from this, and it sounds like you guys are, are, are already doing this to, to some degree is 
you know, as Jamie, one of the things that really struck me was Jamie's comment about how, you know, it's going to be the availability of staff that's going to that, that that's really going to drive whether we can have in-person education, um, and that's going to involve contact tracing and involve. You know, as, as, as someone who just saw his Cleveland Browns get to the playoffs for the first time in 20 years and then watch their coast, coach and a bunch of their offensive line get disqualified because of just the, the tracing protocols, not even necessarily, at least as I understand it at this point, because of positive tests, but just because of the, the isolation and quarantine piece that we have to do as responsible, you know, as responsible educators. Um, I think it's it's, you know, having those plans and really focusing on how we can maintain a, a continuity of le learning experience um, around virtual learning that's not just because of the cold or because of, of whatever, but just how we can do that. And more importantly, how can we switch from that to, I mean, probably we don't want to chunk it into units of less than a week, but, you know, un understanding that we may need to be able to pivot, you know, on a couple days notice. You know, and Murphy's Law says it's going to happen at Christmas or happen at New Year's. So understanding how to, it sounds like we're getting the tools together to give virtual education, to give in-person education, but figuring out the protocols to really pivot that and make it not stressful on our families to know suddenly on a Saturday that, by the way, you know, Jimmy and June aren't coming to school next week. Make sure the parents feel comfortable to, 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 to handle that and not be freaking out, I think. You know, working on on our approach to, to to that matter, I think is 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 key. But I also think, again, you guys are doing a great job. I really I really feel like, yeah, it was crappy, and I but I can't think of a way you could have handled it any better. Good job, you guys. Thanks. Uh, one thing I would share um, also is I think there was this false hustle idea that if like somebody tests positive within a pod, you'll be back to school within two days. I'm just not, I'll, I'll be 100% honest, based on timelines of things, now that I know and you get to spend quality time with my new uh, best friends at the Department of Health, I'm not sure how you make that happen safely. So I think when this pops up again, that's been a big takeaway that Shane and I have reflected on, because we know it's in our communities right now and across the state, the numbers are just growing. Just be aware that while this was an ideal over the holidays, the time that we are not in the building has been to our benefit to make sure that people are following the proper protocols and not coming back before we're sure they've quarantined or isolated, depending on their situation. So I think that's kind of the other share to know that you don't know until you're in this. Ethan, what? Good. Just one thing I'd like to add too. I know Jamie said that we were in, incredibly lucky and, and I do think there is a piece to that. Though I also know, you know, as you've heard, we've worked incredibly hard to keep our schools safe, but we've had tremendous community support right from the get-go, right from day one, when there wasn't necessarily this immediate urgency. I mean, the situation over the... Um, there was some immediate urgency to it. But from the beginning, we've had parents, when we asked them not to get out of their cars, drop kids off at the curb, okay, we'll do that. Fill out the health um, questionnaire, okay, we'll do that. Make sure your youngster has not one, but two clean masks every day, okay, we'll do that. Um, I just think one of the pieces of our luck was the tremendous um, community support we had in our communities right from day one. So I, I just wanted to add that into the conversation. Good. Thank you, Monty. Uh, and then lastly, the next step is just we will reiterate to our community um, that those that are returning to in-person have followed all the proper steps to be back safely. And they're considered healthy, non spreading people <laughs> I, I, that's not the right word but i do think that's the next step you know to really follow through with is we know that everybody this is why working with the department of health is advantageous we know everybody's timeline 
of who's been recommended for what. So. Good. I want to make make sure Megan. Uh, Megan, do you have a comment? No, I just wanted to say thank you. It's been incredibly difficult, and you guys have uh, just really always step up to the plate. So just thank you, and please let us know if there's anything that we can do. Amy? Thanks for everything you guys are doing. It's That's wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Lindy. Thank you, Jamie. All right, moving on to 2021-2022 uh, announced tuition rate. So we are, as you recall, required to set Rochester Stockbridge Unified's District FY22 announced tuition rate by January 15th. And based on what you did last year, which was increasing your tuition announced tuition rate by the projected increase in your budget, which is currently based on the draft budget that we're working on is 3%. I would recommend that that be what you increase your FY22 tuition rate to as well, which would equate to $16,950. I'd like to make a motion. Oh, hold on a sec. Shouldn't, um, shouldn't that be 2%? Isn't that what we asked for? Last I just purely use it based on what we did last year, Ethan, in the draft that we have right now, not based on any adjustments that we may be making moving forward. Does that uh, the recommendation from the Agency of Education is to use the same formula each year. So, Ethan, yeah, I mean, I'll jump in. We're going to get a budget under that, but we want to budget your tuitions higher than that. Okay. Okay. So I don't know if that's fair. Yes, we're going to come with a budget under under 2% under, but it makes sense to us to budget at 3% increase for tuition. Okay, sorry, we, Amy, I interrupted you. Nope, that's okay, which is what we've traditionally done. History, um, we've done 3% increase. I would like to make a motion that we set the announced tuition rate at a 3% increase uh, to be um, – $16,950. Second. Uh, so moved, a second? Who would second it? Jenny, I think. Yeah. Jenny, okay, thank you. Jenny, um, seconded, and any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, Carl? Oh, wait, I, thought, I thought the, the recommended the recommended tuition was 19,453, not 16,453, or did I mishear it? The long formula that was in the documentation I sent to you is not what the Agency of Education recommends that we do when we have histor historically used a percentage to increase your tuition amount each year. So that's why in the email, Carl, I gave the the documentation about how you have historically increased your tuition rate 3%. Ah, okay. Um, I'm hesitant to uh, 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 support that based on the formula and based on our projected 200,000 deficit that uh, we were just presented with. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, certainly I'm one of six. Well, no, Carl, make your point. Make your case. Uh, my you case think we should go with the 19? That we were just presented with numbers that we've lost, you know, that we, we've lost eight tuition students. We um, are 50 grand under on health insurance. Um, you know, we're, we're getting a little bit less uh, uh, in, in a couple other categories. I don't remember off the top of my head because no one, I haven't seen that, the follow-up email that actually has that that um, expenditure uh, uh, revenue document that, that was presented today. But I mean, 3,000, I mean, 3,000 some, some dollars or $2,500 a kid. I mean, if that's, if, if that's based on, 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 on a recommended formula from our business manager that we believe for a lot of other things, I think, I think the fact that historically we haven't increased things 2%, 
uh, or, or I've, I have only increased things by 2%. Um, you know, I, looking at our deficit, I, I think, you know, now is not necessarily the time to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, not take advantage of, 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 of state-based revenue. Well, let's ask. Understand let's ask. that parents do not, parents, I mean, I suppose some parents say, you know, I don't want to send my kid there because the, 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 the tax rate that the town has to pay is higher than the tax rate at this other place. You know, um, we, we have traditionally had tons of kids um, go, I mean, TSA keeps their tuition at, or Sharon Academy keeps their tuition at the uh, union school state average that is lower than, than uh, all the other surrounding tuitions. And we as a board have been neutral and not said, let's push families to go to Sharon Academy because it's cheaper. We said, you know, it's your choice. That's what choice education is. You can send your kids wherever you want. Um, and I don't know that we are, we are, you know, I, I'm sure the taxpayers are happy that we only be charging 17. Oh, Carl, Carl, hold on a sec. Let, let's, let's get some facts on this. Um, Jamie or Tara, can you talk about it? Yeah, the only thing you, I would add is the one issue that the, the one concern we got and Tara ran those figures and then we did check in and review them. I'm a little bit worried that it's at a high enough level, Tara, and you can explain this better that that may require us to pay back. And that's the only thing I'm a bit cautious about. I think you could go higher than the 3%. I'm a little high worried about how high that figure is based on what your per pupil spending is and the fact that we may overcharge districts and have to pay them back. Yes, yeah, so once the state sets the allowable tuition rate, if you have overcharged a district after a long complica complicated formula about your net tuition cost, net cost per pupil and all of that, if that exceeds 3%, you are responsible to pay any districts that paid you the elevated tuition amount back. And with the agency of education being continuously delayed in releasing the allowable tuition rate, as you all may recall, it's supposed to be issued by December per statute. In FY20, we didn't get FY18's tuition rate until the following July. So that that's continuously delaying and you know you get into that bill back and refunding back tuition and that opens up a whole separate issue. So going to the 19,000, I don't what? feel, as Jamie said, I think that's too high. What about um, something in between? What about an extra thousand? We have, how many students do we have come in? But a tuition rate 30, is it? You're receiving 22 tuition 22. students currently, Ethan. Um, what, you know, that's what, was the books. Last year? what was that, Jenny? I'm sorry. What was the allowable tuition rate last year? We don't have that yet from the agency. What was the year before? It was 16... 303. Is there any penalty for going over the allowable? Only that payback? Yes, part? that's if you, yeah. if what you charged in your announced tuition exceeds that 3% net per pupil cost in the formula, that's where you have to pay back tuition. Well, we have to go, we have to go back first because we're in the middle of a, a vote, actually. Uh, we're in the middle of the discussion of, right. of a motion which was made to accept the amount at, was it 16303? Is that the number one? No, 16950. 16950. 16 Thank you. 16950. So um, 16 we can we can discuss we can discuss that we don't want to do this, but we have to finish the vote and then go back and make a motion to a higher number. So um, uh, are we ready? Do we feel ready to vote and I move we amend the motion to move the, the allowable tuition for the uh, fiscal year 21 to $19,000 even. No. That sounds like too much to me. Uh, I would say 17,950. Tara, what, what fiscal year was it that was 16,303? 19. 19. And, and our announced tuition was 16000 so we were just under by $300. If we had gone higher, 
we'd have to pay that back. And that's the, a big Only concern. Only if we went higher by more than 3%. If we're like higher by a dollar, we don't have to give everyone back a dollar. There's a 3% cushion above and below. If we were 3% too low, we'd have to bill back. Historically, our business office has not been able to calculate that number in the, in the window to appropriately bill back, so we've left money on the table. Um, if we bill, if we bill um, 1% too high, we get to collect that money. Um, it's, it's, we have to pay back when we're 3% too high. Is that correct, Tara? Yes, and there is still, my understanding is there's still some FY19 allowable tuition rates that are being recalculated. So that number hasn't even truly been finalized yet. So that's why I say the number seven, 17,950 gives us an extra thousand bucks. It's somewhere in between. It seems a little more, uh, though we could say, what is 3% <laughs> over? 3% over the 16.3. You know, 16,950 and then go under that. It's quick at math. Well, sixteen nine fifty three is where we started from. Yeah. Tara, that's Tara's number. That's that's slightly over three percent over sixteen three oh three. If that makes sense. Okay. Last year's, last year's announced tuition was sixteen four four four, and so three percent higher than that is. Uh, 16,937, but we were increasing it to 16,950. So just 3% three, 3 higher than what we had last year. All right, what's well, our pleasure? Uh, we have an amendment on the floor, but it has not been seconded. Do we want to go ahead with a vote or do, um, do we have more discussion here? Hearing no second, I withdraw my amendment. Okay. Uh, Justine, what's your take? Do we increase the amount or do we keep it at the advised number? I, I feel we should keep it at the advised number, especially where we have no, um, we can't even tell what last year's was. We're kind of just speculating a lot based on 3% of something. And um, I think having to pay back in a year kind of like this might be, more of a thorn in our side than um, the little bit of revenue we might gain by kind of playing the field with it. Okay, good. Megan? Uh, geez, I'm going to have to agree with Jace, Justine. Um, I definitely feel like we, if we go too far above and we have to pay it back, it's definitely going to be a, a bad situation for our board and the budget. Um, so I'm in favor of going with the 3%. Okay, Jenny. So the um, the recommendation of 16,950 is 4% higher than the fiscal year 19, 16,303. So I agree that I, I, you know, we don't know what that number is, but I feel like it, it seems like it's in the ballpark range of what that allowable would be. So I, um, would agree to keep it with the recommended. Okay, and I think we're I think we're ready for a vote. Um, the amendment uh, or the motion has been moved to accept sixteen nine fifty as our announced tuition rate. It has been seconded. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Justine, aye. Amy, aye. Megan, aye. Carl, nay. Jenny, aye. Ethan, aye. Good. Moving on. All right, 7-5. It's like when I used to do a show. You never wanted to have the entrance in the third, first entrance in the third act. <sighs> You've like been sitting back there playing cards the whole time. Okay. The articles, uh, uh, and this will go a little bit to um, uh, answering Vic's question. Uh, the Articles of uh, Agreement Review Committee was formed last, last meeting uh, the, with the mission to uh, look at the articles and improve, look for ways to improve and strengthen the merger. Um, we met three times between these months and worked very hard, some very long meetings. 
um, uh, looking at lots of what we called hot spots. And these were issues of contention um, with the merger agreements and also um, areas of confusion, of uh, misunderstanding um, that we talked about. And there was a lot of public comment uh, uh, about what we were looking at. Um, some of it was definitely educational to me um, as a board member, um, things we had not, I had not looked at um, since I being a board member. We came up with a, uh, a list of sort of action items um, which we thought were prioritized um, and, and things that we needed more information on. Uh, and I'll, I'll say that basically, Vic, to answer your question, and a couple other people raised this point of why are we doing this when there's a, a, a vote looming? Well, because the vote hasn't happened yet. And I am under the assumption as this board, as our general board made, uh, I think two meetings ago, maybe it was three, we all came out and said, I support this merger. And I think it's the way to go forward. I think looking at the numbers presented by Jamie, I still believe the merger is the way to go forward. Um, uh, I think there's things to work out for sure. Uh, some we can work out and some we may not be able to uh, work out, but, um, but we can certainly meet halfway. Um, so I, it is my goal, uh, both with the work we're doing with the high school transfer and with this article agreements committee to hopefully affect that vote and bring people in Stockbridge to feeling like they can, they can work with us. Um, and so they vote down the unmerge. Uh, so I feel like it's a very active process between now and that vote. And that is why one of the th action items we have is a, um, is an amendment that I hope we will um, we will pass tonight, uh, put into action, because I think it's a, a, a very good step in the direction of working things out between our two communities. So, uh, Ray, did you get that email of the action items? Yep. Yeah, if you could put that up, please. Uh, forgive me for the formatting. It's, I usually like to format things a little better, but I think this will give us some idea. Is this the right one? Uh, yes, correct. Thank you. Um, so I'll go through all of these first and then we'll get back to, and also I, I sent you the draft, correct? The draft amendment, so article seven. Yeah, I have that ready when you want it. Good, thank you. Um, all right, so action items, change how school board representatives are nominated and elected. Uh, we have an amendment proposal, intention that each, each town will nominate and elect their own representative. Um, and then uh, we put this at 1A and 1B because 1B was one that actually didn't come up till later in our three meetings, but it's a, a real confusing. Um, it's this article 11, basically what's on our webpage as some people may have looked at is um, all the proposals that happened during the merger and then a articles of agreement and then the warned articles agreement below that. And they don't match. And I've talked to two lawyers about that and worked through this unmatching to exactly what is the articles, what are the articles that hold our merger together? And um, Article 11 is confusing and conflicting. Um, it, it, it basically, and the wording is, let me get to it. Uh, one of the confusions between these two is that the article that was not warned has actually more articles. Um, that's 13 as opposed to 11. Um, and I talked to, I've talked to two different lawyers about this and it seemed to get, uh, I've gotten some good um, uh, um, definition. Uh, the word shall govern, and it says the provisions of the report and formation plan shall govern the unified district. Well, there was some confusion if that report and formation plan was everything before this warned article. Um, that's in the document if you go to the web page. And I could show you that tonight, but I, I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because I feel confident from hearing from two lawyers now that the, bot, the baseline of what we work the merger on is, is um, the warned articles. And that Article 11 is, uh, is that the shell govern is basically shell, is a shell guide that the articles of agreement are included in this, in this whole report and then the articles, but that um, the whole report does not need to, is not the ruling document for us. It is the warned articles. 
So I feel some sense of definition about that. Uh, there may be more discussion about that as we go on. But, uh, I'm sorry, Ethan, uh, let me interrupt. Where yeah. can you show me? I see on the website, Articles of Agreements, WRUD Final 8.9.17 from Owen Bradley. Yes. Where is the, this other document you're talking about? It's, it's at the end of that. It's at if the end. Scroll down. It starts at page. There's two warning. There's two articles of script. One starts at page 14. Articles of agreement. And they say articles of agreement, article one. And the one that is the language, it's attachment E, language for warning, starts on page 23 of what's on our web page. Ethan, are you looking at the ones dated 10 5 17? Are you looking at the ones with the attachment E? Uh, October 10, 5, 17. So the article on the website that says Articles of Agreements, WRD, Final 8, 9, 17. Mm -hmm. What's that? You're under, the, you're under the wrong um, school That's district. district. Here. Let me put it in the chat. Okay. Try that one. As I say, it's it's this is a very confusing process because back and forth we go and we mention one article, but it's actually different in the in the other set of articles that are included in this report, and that it's very important that we stick to the warned articles, um, as that's that's the governance that's the governance document um so so it's the document that's called is it the document that is called rochester stockbridge final report with corrected attachment e 10517 dot docs that's that right. is on our yeah. website okay okay and where are you where is this article 11 that you're um speaking of? Page in the I'm sorry, say it again. Page 25. It's the very last few pages of the doc. Yep. yep. Right before the so signature. That's the, that's the actual warning that had to be warned when we made. Exactly. When we but it's, the, it's not in, this actual article is not in the articles that are listed in the report. And okay. the, the way the lawyer explained this was that there were some things learned in that process and this, but this is the, this is the actual document that we go from. Both lawyers have told me that. Okay. My computer slow. I what is this? Whoa, 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 Carl, I can't, we got to go one at a time here. Okay. Amy, what, what's your saying? Uh, what is the page number? I have page 25, bottom of page 25 on my, on my printout. Okay, my it's frozen. Okay, go ahead, Carl. Mine's I'm that, frozen. I that link it. that link tells me that there's 15 pages to that document that end with an Article Three about electing officers, dated. Did another link that has oh, a longer? Oh, oh. Jenny, I would Jenny just what? say that I was just saying that Lindy posted another link that that's longer than the the first one is 15. Justine, help me here. On the uh, from the link that uh, Lindy posted in the chat, it's page twelve, and it says the language for the warning, attachment E, language for warning. That's okay. what the public was voting on. That language. Yeah. Okay, and where in that are we discussing this um, article eleven? Go to eleven. I just say it once. Say article eleven. I'll just say number eleven. There he goes. Number eleven. Okay. So the what confused us? Listen, listen for a sec. Yep. What confused us is that it says here we've 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 been told we were told by the first lawyer, Dina Atwood, that the art, warned articles and voted on articles. That's the bedrock. That's what that's what everything gets decided on as far as the as, as far as the district. But then we looked at Article 11. It says the provisions of the report and formation plan approved by the State Board of Education. So that is all this other information that is on our website, which is has the committee proposal, background, 
um, history of the schools all the way through a draft articles of agreement um, with also um, uh, some, um, some appendices of numbers, things like that, no merger scenarios and stuff like that. So there was some confusion and also there was the presentation at the, um, at the uh, BOE, which is videotaped. And it was like, well, is, okay, is that part of this report? This, all these informations, is that part of this report? And both lawyers have said, no, the, doc, the governing document is, and that began, because this report and formation plan includes the warrant article, that is still the document. So this is what I'm getting from the lawyer. This is the, this is what we have to go. So I feel comfortable moving forward with an amendment to these articles based on um, that this is the bedrock. These articles of agreement are the bedrock of our um, association together with Stockbridge. Carl. I would most definitely, before we decide to amend something tonight, I most definitely want to have an, a, an executive session with an attorney to discuss the implications of this because as someone that was present at, at, at that state board meeting and as someone who was involved with, with the putting of all this together, this does not at all jibe with, with my recollections. So I am firmly wait, against- Wait, what do you mean your recollection of what? Doing any sort of amendment to articles of agreement without having an attorney to, to advise me. I'm hearing from well, you I'm what the attorney has said to you. I'm not hearing, hearing from an attorney what, what, you know, directly, much like we heard from attorneys directly about buildings and such. Okay. So you need to hear, you need to hear directly from an attorney about this before, before you can go forward. Absolutely. I will, I, I'm certainly, I will make myself available for a special meeting that's at the board and, 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 and Dina's convenience or whoever the second lawyer is. I'm not sure who else you might've talked to. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, Dina is, is our official counsel, but you've talked to someone else. Um, I'm not sure, but in any case, I, 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 I would, I would need to have an explanation from, from an attorney of what we're looking at and what its implications are before I could support anything. Okay. I, I, I hear you on that. Um, good. Let's go around. Let's go around on that. And this may be, you know, this is where we, 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 we go tonight. I, I was hoping to move the article because as I said, because what I've heard is made me feel confident but you all need to feel confident to move forward. And this may involve a special meeting that we get together. And yeah, uh, I mean, we were, I was told specifically by an attorney that we could not have separate in, in the course of the building um, committee issues that we could not have separate bonding. Um, so there could not be the, the specific suggestion the building committee had put forward. And I took to the attorney was that, and the attorney was Dina Atwood was that, could Rochester vote a bond that Rochester taxpayers would only pay to support Rochester building improvements or whatever based on that building committee report? And could Stockbridge support their own bond that would only be voted on by Stockbridge, uh, by, 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 by Stockbridge voters that would support bonding whatever work needed to be in, done to the Stockbridge building? The thinking at the time was that, you know, they're Rochester's buildings. They've been neglected under Rochester's care. Those things should be approved by Rochester tax dollars. Stockbridge mm -hmm. buildings, they've been neglected under, Stock, uh, under Stockbridge uh, voters' care. Those should be improved by the dollars of, of Stockbridge um, uh, voters. And I was told very, very clearly, at least as I understood it, that once a district is a district, it is the district. There can't be separate it's fine. For, for, for who could be what or what could be bonded to who, that it's all one collection of people and it's majority rule between the citizens of Stockbridge or the registered voters of Stockbridge and the registered voters of, 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 of Rochester. So you're saying that we could amend things so that this you know could, could, could work in a town by town way. While I like that idea, because I really like the idea of, for example, Rochester well, being resp responsible for Rochester stuff and Stockbridge being responsible for Stockbridge's stuff, um, as I understood it, this is not at all legal. Um, okay, well, let me just tell you, one, it's, it's, it is legal because it's already in three other districts in our SU. They already have town voting 
um, town nominating and voting for the representatives. And Jamie confirmed that today for me. So that's correct. Uh, yes. Just because they have it doesn't mean it's legal. It just means it hasn't been challenged in court. Well, well, um, it's, it's just for elected officials, Carl. Yeah, well, I'm not it's talking not about bonding. For this is overall just for budget. elected officials. Yeah, this is not, we're not talking about anything else. It's very, has to be very specific. One of the um, things that was made clear to us very early on our committee work was that any article that was needed changing, that article had to be worn separately. You know, that you had to go piece by piece through any article. So it's no small matter to get any article changed in this thing. It's not a willy nilly kind of thing. There's balances and checks all the way through. The first one is we present this to you. And um, I understand that there might be a reason we need to get together. You hear it from the lawyer's mouth and uh, so you feel you can go forward. And then maybe that's where we you know, move this amendment once you fe all feel. Um, um, and also I, I think we should get uh, check in with everybody else about this. Jenny, how are you feeling? Um, I guess another question would be not only the, the legality of it, but if this is a, a document that was approved by the State Agency of Education and we alter that, um, do we need to run that by the state again if we're changing it? I don't believe so. I believe it's controlled. What I, the information I received was that it was controlled by the voters as long as it goes to a vote of both commun communities that we are, these are living documents and that they can be altered to suit what our needs, changing needs so are. So then how can the state, can, I mean, can we just change it to whatever? It seems like if they approve something, I don't know, I guess I would need formal documentation of that, that on that. Okay. We provide updated articles of agreement once they're amended. Mm-hmm. Just so folks know. So have you, have you made other amendments within other SU mergers, Jamie? Oh, we haven't yet, no. no but, but the potential, our, our, legal, our legal advice was the potential, yes, you can. And Donna, Donna Russo Savage also said, yes, you can. And in fact, some of this is not even, um, well, no, I won't go down that rabbit hole. We'll just say that she said that, yes. So there's three actual legal advisors that I've had. Dina, um, the other lawyer we had, and this was- is, uh, Bernie Lambeck, who has been doing work for other districts within the SU. Yep. So we asked, uh, our committee members asked for a second opinion. And so I, I sought that out on these matters. Um, he has not looked at the full extent of all that we've looked at, but he has looked at the articles of agreement and the report um, so that we've, um, we've, gone f we've gone forward with that. All right, Justine, where are you? Um, I, I, I obviously was a part of the committee, so I am in support of this. I think that I, I would like to welcome all the questions and I understand that maybe legal counsel the advice from legal counsel may be helpful for the rest of the board. We did get to have a session with legal counsel and we get to, we got to ask our questions uh, of the council. So Thank you. I, I can agree that that would be important. Good. Amy. Sorry, Mike, I keep getting dropped here. So um, I kind of missed a, a few minutes there. Um, I am... I guess the question, here's the question. What do you need to move forward? I mean, what I'm hoping to propose and the committee wants to propose is this amendment um, the am to the I, voting rights. Okay, so that what you're asking for is an amendment, the, the number one, to change how the school representatives are nominated and elected. Yes. Okay. Oh, did it just drop me again? No. No, you're here. I can hear you. <laughs> I see you. This is getting very frustrating. Um, <laughs> Uh, to clarify, um, the you mentioned that there's other districts where the town um, votes, individually votes their representative. Nominates now, and votes, yes. Now, uh, it did sound like Jamie said no articles of agreement have been changed, so that was or, um, original to their articles of agreement then. Correct. Correct, okay. Um, Yeah, I I definitely have um, some concerns about the specific article. Um, 
I, and I don't know, if, but I do want to make sure we have correct legal counsel before we do uh, dive into changing anything. That makes sense. Okay. Um, um, but I don't know if you want me to say my comment about um, about the the specifics of what you're asking right now, or um, but really, I think we need to, to have um, uh, counsel to, to that we are doing things correctly. Okay. Um, Megan. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate this committee. I think what you guys have been putting forward is definitely really solid work. I think that would help move our district in a, in a better position, but I am going to agree that we're going to need some legal counsel. I, I, this is a lot to digest. I just want to take it in tonight. I'd like mm -hmm. to get counsel and then, you know, we make, I would make myself available for a special meeting. Absolutely. I would love to do that. Um, cause, um, uh, I'll be honest. Um, um, I'll be honest that, you know, some of the concern of, of, of Stockbridge members of the committee was that the board would sort of push, push things down the road as opposed to doing this. And there is a, there is a time constraint, not that that should pressure us because we need to, we need to be confident in our vote on this. Um, uh, the idea of when it can be put to, uh, this, this warning, if you read the top of the warning and we haven't put that up yet. Um, Sorry, Ray, why don't you put the article up just so we can see it right now. And the idea is that this, this would be warned for town meeting day. Um, that we would, it would be a special meeting that would then be an Australian by Australian ballot that this amendment would be voted on, um, uh, on, on town meeting day. Uh, which, of course, is the same day that uh, Stockbridge will be voting um, for to merge or unmerge with Rochester. Um, and this was this was prepared for us. This draft was prepared for us by Dina Atwood and edited by Ber um, Bernie Limbeck. So this text, this text talks about amending article. Seven. We've been talking about Article Eleven. Eleven is is the one about where the where the power really rests. That's a, it's a different issue than this. Yeah, Article Seven okay. is what we'd be amending, but we had to find out if that was the right area to amend. So. Just doing the time constraint, and we had Amy, um, Jenny, Justine, Megan, Megan agreed too. Um, then I would love, I would love for this to happen. I would love to do this this week because I think it would be a sign that we're moving forward with this, that we would move a special meeting to meet with council about this issue and to regard and vote on this amendment because I think it's a pretty important amendment to put forward showing our support of how we, um, you know, we're working to make things work better in this merger. And I think for me, this feels like a, 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 a no, if it's legal and it's acceptable as I've heard that it is, um, this seems like a very reasonable request to even out some of the voting. Um, Stockbridge is always, will always suffer in this merger by being a minority vote. Um, on most issues. And that was one of the sources of greatest concern in the merger. And there really is, you know, as I talked to both lawyers about, there's no real way to change majority votes on, on certain issues. But there are, in these cases, this is one of the issues where you can affect how the vote is and it doesn't have to just be by majority. Or as, as, the, as the term is in the current um, articles, at large, voting, which means everybody voting altogether, majority wins. I'm not opposed to the text, the amendment itself. It's more so the, the legalities and, um, you know, making okay. sure that, that it's kosher. How's, how's and I would also, I know that there's concerns in Stockbridge, but I would also like to point out that I believe the last vote did have more Stockbridge voters than Rochester, if I remember correctly, or one of the two did. Can I just to jump in, I mean, you, I'm just going to throw out there, just as you know, you're superintendent. You Jim, had I'm having to, trouble hearing you. Sorry, I just want to throw out that 
that the committee did have Dina in a meeting. Yes. And that and you had two board members there present. It was public meeting. And in addition to that, your two different attorneys wrote this for you. So you can have a special meeting and bring an attorney in it's totally, you know, if that's what the board's wish is, just a reminder that that does come at an additional cost. Just wanted to put that up. Jamie, it does. And it would be nice to, I mean, we've had an attorney for additional cost sitting in meetings telling us again and again and again about how we need to, um, you know, really think about dividing up the uh, sewer plat around the, the the high school building. I really feel kind of, kind of, I mean, I approve of the Carl, idea. I'm, I'm, Carl, Carl, hold on. It's, I, I'm, I'm going with you. We're going to make this happen. We're going to put you in a room with a lawyer um, and we're going to do it. I, I'm just going to make it happen soon. How about Thursday? Um. Thursday may be bad for me. I could do it next Tuesday, but that's not something we should be be, be debating now. What I'm objecting well, to the most actually, strenuously no, no, no. But Carl, is the I think idea it is the point. of being blindsided by an amendment to uh, the Articles of Agreement that you know we're not even you know bring this to us with the attorney next time, please. Okay. I thought that my experience with the attorney was enough, and I, I made a mistake with that. Okay. Um, well, Tuesday, a meeting Tuesday would still get us in. Um, would still get us in in time for. I think it's the thirty first is when we would have to. January thirty first is the deadline for getting it for warning the special me meeting. Um, I just I want to let the board know that. Ray will be navigating three board meetings at the same time on Tuesday night if you go with it. Yeah, that's okay. Yep, good. Um, all right. Well, I'd say it's, it's, it's a consensus about this. That, um, Ethan? Uh, yeah. Amy. Was there, I see that there was uh, kind of three action items. Um, was there additional items that we, we need to be considering um, at this time, or would you just wanted to bring this one? Issue. No, I was gonna I was gonna go through them all, um, but okay. uh, I'm not I'm not I'm not sure that's a good idea right now. No, I think okay. we, I think we need to uh, earn the 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 faith and trust of the board right. that our work has been sincere and is supported by legal counsel. And yeah. once we have yeah. that, then we can start working on other things. But as I said, I. You know, I can I can hear and I see Charity's hand going up, going up, going up. Um, uh, you know, the, I can hear the people who've been really supporting our work getting really upset because um, this is just what they predicted is that we would sort of pass it on. But that said, I uh, we have to work as a board, and the board consensus is clear that we need to put ourselves in the room with a with a lawyer so all questions can get answered and be clarified. Um, if uh, I do think this is the time to be talking about this. Um, uh, by the way, it wasn't black. I did send you uh, that we had an amendment um, that we were proposing. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't a total surprise when I sent this out on, on Sunday, I believe. Um, so there was two days warning that we were gonna be proposing an amendment uh, to the articles. Uh, Tuesday, Justine, Tuesday night. I'm not quite sure if I'll be available. I can be available to listen. Uh, might not be able, uh, able to participate. I don't have child care that night. Okay. Amy? Yeah, let me look. I think it'd be fine. I... Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Jenny? That should work. Thank you. Um, uh, Megan? I'll be there. Okay. Uh, I'm going to say we'll go, we'll go with Tina. Well, I'll talk to you about, um, Jane, we'll figure this out. Okay. So we're going to warn a special meeting to, and the agenda will have two items. It'll be executive session to talk over, um, amendments while well, talk to with our, our legal counsel about the articles of agreement. And then when we come back to public session, I would like to, um, 
talk on on the appeal. I, I think actually a special meeting just to talk about all the recommendations is actually a very good idea because I think doing it at 906 at night, I think we're going to be fresher. I think you'll all come into it. If you feel that there is legality behind it, that I'll come, you'll come with a more open mind. And I think um, to try and keep going with this is, uh, um, you know, is, is, is fruitless tonight. So I will warn the meeting for Tuesday, next Tuesday. And we will, we will do our best. Good. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on. Seven, six. Outdoor Ethan, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just think yeah. it's, imp it's important to this. Yeah. You stated the 31st, but Dina's recommendation was no later than the 29th. 29th. That's all Thank I have you. to say. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Charity. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. You came in for that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't. I was sort of dealing with the board stuff. I'm sorry. I didn't call on your hand. I apologize for that. Um, all right. So seven six outdoor learning structures. Um, some of you may have seen on um, Greg Ryan's web Facebook page. Those of you are Facebook. Uh, these rather extraordinarily beautiful structures. Um, and cricket, you can actually talk to this a little bit. You're on here for the building committee. Um, we basically one of these structures has been donated already to uh, the school and we're looking into grants um, possibilities to get more of them. Uh, they are wood uh, structures, uh, engineered wood structures with fiberglass roofs. Um, they're quite wonderful. Um, I'm sorry I can't share a picture of you right now, but um, uh, Cricket, what can you what can you say about them? I think that'd be great to have you check in on this. Yeah, Greg Greg has a great concept. We're working through a few little improvements to it to make it a little more robust. But I mean, compared to a tent, these things are they're awesome. And he's a he's a very instinctive kind of engineer type person who's come up with a really practical, I think, fairly easy to erect with volunteers. Um, yeah. Out, what could be used as an outdoor learning structure. So I'm, I'm helping them with a few technical things to make sure they're really robust, but I was really impressed with what he came up with. I do have uh, a photo if, if you want, I can share it. A photo? Yeah, sure. Have, did you say there was a website that Greg had? Oh, that it was on Facebook. Oh, okay. Facebook. It's on Facebook, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me see if I can get the photo up here and then maybe share my screen. Um, Shouldn't take too, too long. Uh, let's see. They, he's he's, well, he's working on that. The, one of the things Bonnie asked that I bring it before the board, the idea that we accept, um, accept this uh, donation as a, um, and, and obviously work, you know, work to get, um, we have to have at least, you know, we get one, we have to have two. As we say, all considerations for uh, one campus need to be considered for both. Um, and so um, we're working on the funding and I don't think we would take, I mean, a donation is a donation. Um, uh, uh, the, I don't think it was specified where it went. Uh, so that could be a decision of ours, but Bonnie wanted to make sure that we felt okay about um, accepting, um, accepting these, uh, this donation. Um, so I would take any feedback you have. I can shoot a picture up right now if you want. Ethan. Sure, go for it, Cricket. Um, so let me, can you guys see that? Nope, not yet. Okay. Um, uh, when we get some comments, uh, Justine, how do you feel about this or what are your questions? I think these are great. I'm pretty familiar with them. Um, the thing that I think is really interesting is they're really um, movable. They're not, they're made of wood, but you can, you can move them around and stuff and they're very sturdy. So I think this is a great, a great uh, opportunity to explore outdoor, indoor learning, um, potentially with heaters or something like that. I'm really in support of, of these 
structures and I would love to accept the donation obviously and maybe look at more into getting um, grant money or something to uh, get some more of them. Did that come up, Ethan? Uh, nope, I'm not seeing anything yeah. yet. Yeah, I see it now. You see it? Oh, yeah. I don't have it. Yeah, so this is, I think, a slightly larger one than um, the one that would come. Uh, we're working through some strength details of the larger one, but it's it's the same same kind of design. So would you have sides that could be put on it or? That's, Greg says there are a lot of different options with it. There can be, there could be some sides put on it. There could also be um, uh, benches put in between the, the trusses, um, uh, potentially how they put the ends on. I think it's the idea of, of sort of flexible outdoor structure. Um, and, and Bonnie and I have talked about placement of them. Uh, where they could be in a more permanent way so that we would have permanent outdoor structures as opposed to these tents, which really, as we've learned from what happened to Amy's, are um, uh, really, you know, fall, fall, spring. Uh, they're not winter tents. Uh, Megan, got a comment? Uh, I think they're fantastic, and I would love to work um, to make more outdoor education happen on our campuses, and this is a great donation, and, and we can definitely look um, towards PTO funding, some of it, or just look to other resources to, to get a second one. Okay. Jenny? Yeah, I think a, I think a donation of one of these is um, pretty awesome, and I was curious how much one of these costs. Uh, they're in the uh, four to five thousand dollar range. Uh, to give you a sense, that's. It also depends whether we have a crew from volunteers putting it up or the company itself puts it up. That can save us a thousand or two bucks. Um, uh, what was the other point I was going to make about that? Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Nope, it's gone. Okay, uh, if it comes back, so that cost would be would include installation. It would be cheaper if we put it up. Yes, and this is, you know, this is bolts and bars and things like that. Lindy? I guess my only question in Cricket, something to just kind of keep in mind, I want to, I think this is fabulous. I want to reiterate that. I think this is a great opportunity. I want us to think about our biggest class size and how we have to space kids out at that six feet foot space. Cool. Cause that's like an added bonus. So just um, structurally, like there's some math that's, I'm happy to sit in on. I'm not sure I should be leading the charge, but I just think I'm thinking of our tent scenario from the fall and like how we really had to be really mindful of who got what size tent to make sure that it was a good functional space for all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and obviously, Tia Cricket, I'm, I, you know, I'm in on your emails with Greg, and there's, there's, there's a, few, you know, there are some kinks to be worked out in this. I don't know whether these will be. I doubt they'll be fully active before spring, um, but we'll see. I, uh, we'll see how that goes. And obviously, we need your letter of approval on them, on them, Cricket. Uh, Megan, Jenny, um, Carl, do you have a comment on these? <laughs> of course, I do. I'm me. Um, I, I will say I, I like the design a lot just from looking at the picture because one of the things I've seen with some of the um, information about like restaurants trying to set up outdoor structures in New York City and Boston where they're actually making more enclosed structures than their actual building was because they're making these plastic huts and sticking heaters in them. And I really like the idea that we can manage which sides are open and which sides are closed or it looks, at least it looks like, like we can. The other thing I, I would want to, to add to the conversation um, for getting them to put together and getting the money is that, you know, when we built that ball field in Stockbridge, we, uh, the Johnsons got us a great grant and we were able to do the matching piece of it with the labor. So if we could, if, if there were grant opportunities and I don't, you know, I certainly don't have time to find them and I'm not expecting you, Ethan or Bonnie or Lindy, but, if there are ways that we could find someone that could say, we'll, we'll pay for the materials if you put up the labor in terms of, in, in, in terms of supporting that, I really think that, you know, I, I know 
that in Stockbridge, when we put out the call for people to help build uh, that uh, a kitchen hut and uh, do the grading of the ground and all that, we had more volunteers than we could use. So I really think that we, you know, if we put this project together and said, let's try to do it as a community and get some buy-in from uh, some local contractors and people to help do some of the construction work, we can maybe uh, 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 get, a, you know, you know, a couple of them at each campus. Um, you know, just a lot to throw out there. Well, that's, I mean, that's certainly my thinking is that if this, if this is the type of structure, and I love that it's locally produced as well, um, is that, you know, and obviously being the tent, the tent man, as my t-shirt said, um, I would love to see two of these at each campus at least, um, you know, that I think moving forward, these tents are great. They got us where they did. They were cheap. Oh, that was it. It was just to give an idea. I believe, Lindy, we spent about 1500 per tent. Uh, might have been less than that. Might have been around 1000 And then we probably put about another 250 in materials per tent to reinforce them and make them strong enough to, uh, uh, to survive at all. So, you know, 3000 for something that's much more permanent and really gets us out. This gets me to a question for administrators. You don't need to answer now, but I would really love to see um, some sort of framework, some sort of intent of what we're, um, what these spaces need to be used for. What do you want them to be used for? What do the teachers want to use them for? Because um, I think that's, we're sort of a little bit putting the cart before the horse. Oh, a roof over kids' heads. That's, what, that's, that's fine. That's all we need. And I think the idea of ventilation, um, even after COVID, hopefully there is a time after that, um, um, you know, what exactly it is we're looking for. But that said, we have one donated and let's look for the f fundraising. I think we will keep going in this and I'll keep you posted. Good. Thank you. I'll just add, I'll have a better analysis by next month of our ESSER funds that could be available that could offset the cost of one. Great. Great. Um, and certainly anybody listening to this who happens to have, you know, some donation possibilities, maybe we start a GoFundMe, you know. Um, I just wanted to say to Howard that I put the website in the chat where the prices and sizes of all of them are listed. Um, right. You can review the different sizes for, for that and then also the price for um, both put together and if, if you just get the kit. Good. All right. I think we've done that. 7-7, uh, seven, seven, sale of the Rochester High School property. Um, amazingly, this might, one, we have no executive session scheduled because there is basically one step. We have received a map um, that, uh, Bonnie, I'm sorry, I realized I did, should have asked you this question. Bonnie, have you looked at that, that map? Did you see it? I have not, I have not, Ethan. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, I thought you had gotten onto that. Um, but I will say, um, uh, uh, it does follow what you and I walked. Um, so, I think I have a copy of that, Ethan, if you okay. want. Yeah, I well, can actually, it's not, it's not supposed to be, David said it should not be public yet until we've been negotiating. Okay. Basically, okay. that's the step we're at now, is to set up a, um, a small committee of board members, one from each town, uh, to start negotiations with the select board. Um, uh, and possibly not the full select board, just an individual so that we have a rep representative group going forward to start the negotiations, looking at the map before we go to the permitting process. That is, that is sort of the, the way to go forward. So what I would like to do tonight is entertain a motion to, um, uh, uh, to, start, this, to start this committee. I'm perfectly happy to be the member from Rochester if nobody else wants to step up uh, or feel strongly about that. Um, uh, if there's another, um, but he had a term, David had a term for this. Do you remember what it is, Jamie? Contact something, I can't remember. Doesn't matter, we're getting the idea across. Um, and this, this is basically we're charging um, an individual group to go and begin negotiations. A control group. A control group. Yes, that's it. that was his term. Um, do we have any further?
can we move it and second it and discuss it? So moved. All right. Any discussion about this group? Anybody from Stockbridge want to step up and be on the committee? Well, I, don't we need a second? I mean, I I I don't think that my motion twenty one brain automatic second, but that's just my ego. I'll yeah. second. Second. Thank you, Justine. Um, uh, uh, good. So we're into that. We've got a motion uh, to start a. Uh, a committee, a small committee to negotiate with the town of Stockbridge. Um, I, I'm stepping up for one member. Is there somebody else who would step up? If Are it were helpful, I would do it. If you think I would not be helpful, I will stand aside. Carl, I think you'd be fine. You're, you're looking for one Rochester, one Stockbridge board member. Yes. So we're not a quorum. We don't have to worry about quorum as far as meeting with the lawyer, um, uh, but that we could sit down and negotiate and then obviously bring that back to the board. I see, okay. Um, I'm, does anybody else have reservations about Carl being on this negotiation committee? Him and his ego. <laughs> <laughs> and actually as I look at my picture, my big shiny bald head. But yeah, well there you go, hey. That could, we, we might blind them with our, with our reflections. <laughs> if we don't get it with our logic, we'll get it with our forehead. Very good. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Megan? No, I just want to say thank you guys for volunteering. Good. Justine? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, Pat, I see your hand raised. Uh, let me just get through. Amy? Um, no, I guess not. Oh, come on. What is it? <laughs> no, no, that's no, okay. Okay. Uh, and Jenny, any questions? No, that good. Thank you, Carol and Ethan, for doing that. Good. All right. Uh, so the committee has been formed. All in favor signify by saying uh, a, a committee to be negotiate the transfer of the high school building with the select board. Oh, Pat. Sorry, Pat. Let's, let's just hear from Pat real quick. Yeah, go ahead, Pat, please. I just have a quick um, question comment. Um, this process also needs to go through the zoning board of Rochester. So are you planning on doing it after the fact or? Um, yeah, the idea that David's thought was that better to negotiate the boundary first before it goes through zoning. We're ready. That was his, that was his thinking. And that can be part of our negotiation too. Yeah, because that takes time too. No, yeah, I understand. I understand. I'm just, um, I feel like we're at the step and I was really eager to get us negotiating, get us talking to each other finally, formally. Great. Good. Um, okay. Uh, so the, the proposal ahead is to start a um, control committee of a member from Stockbridge, a member of Rochester to negotiate with the uh, town of Rochester for the transfer of the high school building. All in favor signify by saying aye. Amy? Aye. Megan? Aye. Justine? Aye. Jenny? Aye. Carl? While it would be really kind of ironic for me to vote no uh, for the position I just volunteered for, I will vote aye. Yeah, <laughs> but I would expect you actually. Okay. Um, and I say aye. Great. You're done. Okay. So we, um, we're going to go to Punk. Ethan, just before you move on, just just I want to stand corrected. When you said that I see the map, my brain was thinking of some larger map of the site. I did see the map of that property line that you and I walked. Yeah, the, the one that does the little jog yeah. around the playground. Yes, yeah. I just wanted to, I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, good. Um, no, this feels great. I really appreciate this, and uh, we will we will uh, we will move forward. Um, great. I don't think. We have no we have new hires. hires, Jamie. No, nope. Okay. Thank you. Let's let's do our public comment. All right, Barb DeHart, do you have a comment here? Normally I do, but I don't. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Charity. Very interesting. I'll say that though. Charity Colton. 
Um, my question is kind of more towards Lindy and Jamie. So it's sounding not unexpected that we're going to be in a last minute possible decision when it goes to going back to school live or stay virtual. Um, and obviously I have kids in the school and it's working, although I'm admittedly not a good teacher. Um, <laughs> will we, is there a potential plan for getting a message out to families sooner than the possible of Saturday, Sunday with, even if it's just by email, additional documents that we can add to say our literacy packets and our math packets and stuff like that as a preemptive move, even if we don't end up using them. Yeah, I'll just jump in. So Charity, I have an admin team meeting on Thursday afternoon with all my principals to review the current data and status and then say to them, here's the action plan in regards to how I will communicate out to the community and what your expectations are to communicate out to staff. So yes. Okay. And Charity, I've also told staff to be ready for either or. So they need to be thinking about how to get stuff like that out. Yeah, I, I'm assuming that you guys have. I just know like for us, the boys have already gone through all but one of their literacy pieces and we're on day two. So send you more. I, hear, I know, well, that's my thought is. I'm really excited that I just said that. Uh, both boys are, but I hear that we need to send you some more. I'll make sure that happens. Yeah. and. It, you know, I'm, I only bring it up because, you know, their teacher for that had said to them today, we didn't want to give you too much. We didn't want to give you too little. But if we're heading into a potential possible last minute notification that we're not going back, then, yeah, like I know my boys are going to need more literacy info. So I am, and I'll just add just uh, charity. I think we'll have a pretty good sense for Stockbridge um, actually on Friday just because we've been monitoring you so closely. I actually think it could be more last minute for my some of my other schools potentially because of the surveillance testing versus Stockbridge. So I think you'll have a pretty good sense Friday of what the decision is. Okay. And then the other question I had is also kind of around that is, um, Lindy, you made a perfect comment that we all have to be honest about our, you know, day-to-day -day activities and if we get the sniffles is it really because we cleaned out the garage and got the sniffles or is it actually a symptom so my question around that is because lindy knows and i'm not afraid to say it in front of everybody um i have kids with allergies and she and i and jane have been communicating on a very regular basis about what kid needs to do what and what documentation we need to get and i have found it nearly impossible to get a doctor's office to actually give us an appointment to say this is just his normal allergies send him back to school because he has no fever he has no other symptoms that are not already documented pre-existing symptoms but if we want to truly be honest how how where's the fine balance there yeah. because there's a definite disconnect between the, the school building that your child is in and they know your child pretty intimately with the size of our schools, your doctor's office, who, in my opinion, may not know your child quite as intimately and Vermont Department of Health. And there's three different sets of instructions going on. So as Lindy knows, I spent over a week getting an additional set of documents to Lindy in order to validate for not the first, not the second, but the third time, my child's allergy situation and medication. So we need, I think we need some help and I think we need to put this situation up the ladder that this is happening because I know it's not happening in just our school or RSU, it's happening statewide and even beyond that, that there's a serious lack of communication of what the state is telling the doctors, the state is telling the school, the Doctors are telling the parents, the school nurse is telling the parents. And if you guys want to continue giving kids a good education, we got to find some way to get this more in line be until we get vaccines. And how do we do that? That's, that's my big question. And I apologize. I know it's hugely loaded, but 
as someone living in a household that's been dealt with, that's been dealing with this three times already this school year, and is Wendy's probably sick of having to deal with it with me. Um, I don't know how to move forward any differently than we have, but it's definitely been an extremely difficult process, even before the community situations in our local area. Uh, Jamie, you want to speak, finish speaking to that quickly? You're, you're muted, Jamie. Chair, imagine that. I'm not used <laughs> to that. Charity, um, I'll just say that I absolutely hear your frustrations. It's something that we certainly been trying to take up at the state level with the agency of ed and the Department of Health as superintendents. And it's, you know, I think the one of the positives, if we are a glass half full, feel like we've built a really good rapport with our local Department of Health. And so I hope that they can help us better navigate those situations when they come. Good. Charity, anything further? I know you're done. Okay. Um, Dune Hendricks, do you have a comment? No, just thank you all for all the time and energy you put into this. It, um, it's, um, it's a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Janet Whitaker, do you have a comment? No, I'm good. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Joanne Mills, do you have a comment? Oh, dear. I'm sorry, Joanne. Oh. All right, well, can't hear you, I'm afraid. Um, let's do it again. Why don't you try and come back in and we'll get back to you. Um, Karen Rubin, do you have a comment? I can't see you. No, Ethan, I just want to say that I appreciate everybody who is on the Articles of Agreement Committee. You guys have been working really, really hard, um, quite a bit of hours over the holidays and for long hours in those meetings. So I really appreciate the work that that committee has put in to be able to come to the board and give a solid and thorough, uh, well thought out recommendation with all of the expertise that was um, brought into the meeting as well. So I appreciate the work that you guys have done on that. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Cricket, as a townskeep person, do you have a comment? Um, I guess, I guess my only comment is just from a personal place is to, I feel like not be afraid to put safety first for a couple months. I think it's really important for everybody. And I think kids grow in a lot of situations. So that's, that's just a personal little aside, but I know everybody's working really hard and I appreciate that. Good. Thank you, Cricket. Um, working down, do Megan, Pat, Harvey, do you have a comment? Uh, no, I don't have a comment. I look forward to getting together with uh, you and Carl and uh, move forward. Great. Thank you. Rob Gardner, do you have a comment? Uh, yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So I'll, I'll try to be brief. You know I have uh, problems with the uh, amending these agreements that were already voted on by two towns. And uh, I talked about it during the meetings publicly, and I also sent you an email so I'd only ask that you carry those comments with you, whether specifically or in spirit, in this um, meeting you have with the lawyers. And also, mm -hmm. remember, you know, there's a R Rochester side to this story. As a Rochester person, I was uncomfortable with it. So that's all, all I'll say about that. I, I, I also want to say that I really appreciate the tremendous amount of work and thought that everybody in this meeting tonight has put in. I particularly thought the uh, SU did a great job, and Jamie in the business office. I was very happy to hear that kind of clear and helpful feedback from you guys. And um, regarding the COVID situation, I have a granddaughter who's really struggling with uh, um, out of school learning. Terribly, grades are, grades are hurting and she's very unhappy. But if you said to her, well, we can send you back to school to see your friends, but your grandfather might die. If you put it to her in those terms, because that's how I think about it. So I know the, of the tremendous pressure that's on the schools to educate, to do the best job you can, but to err on the side of safety, particularly when there's so much 
that's unknown. Communication is so difficult um, uh, that people are, are contagious without having symptoms, that we're now hearing about a faster spreading uh, version of this. I think which, uh, we really should be extremely, extremely judicious. And I hope, Jamie, that you will, as I'm sure you will, take this uh, very much to heart. We're talking about people's lives, particularly the elderly, particularly the grandchild, grandparents in the community. So uh, I, again, I thank you all and I appreciate your hard work. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. Tim Pratt, do you have a comment? Jamie? Oh, Jamie? What? oh Joanne, get, hold on, Tim. Can you hear me? Let's go. Yes, interrupt. Joanne, we can hear you. Uh, okay, I'm going to interrupt him. Sorry. No, that's good. Uh, you're <laughs> um, very faint. I just, want, I just want, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, I just want to thank Ethan, Charity, Justine, and Tim for all the work they did on that board. Um, and it's a sh it's a darn shame that they can't trust you guys. Um, I was on all those meetings, and uh, we there were lawyers there. They did a lot of research. I, I really don't understand, but um, that's okay. Delay it. It sends a great message to Stockbridge, and uh, we're listening. Um, the other thing I or I'm listening. I'm not speaking for everyone in my town. I don't want to get that wrong but I'm listening uh, to the message it's sending. Uh, second of all, uh, in the beginning, when someone asked about the budget and why, um, why, why would Stockbridge want to get out of the merger, there is one concern, and I just want to make it clear that, um, and Carl knows about this, it, Carl actually wrote a report a year and a half ago that talks about the buildings in the two towns. Uh, Lindy was on that um, that committee as well, um, and so was um, Cricket and um, Rob and a few others. Oh, and, and Bonnie. And what we found out, we hired, or the board hired Black River Design to do a building study. And what they found out was, and yes, there's been some repairs since this, but um, on average, and this comes from Carl's report, that uh, Stockbridge, if they did the basics, would be about 141,000 to bring that up to safe and uh, basic standards. The um, Rochester Elementary School would be $1,398,063. So this is a concern. It's not personal. It's not a personal thing. It's about, not, it's about the situation, about what we've got in our town and what's gonna come down the road as a bond, possibly, I don't know, I, you know, but what we talked about in these meetings in the building committee. Um, and so if there's a question, it's not personal, it's not about one, com one town versus the other, it's about future expenditures. And um, so I just wanted to get that out there. People in Rochester are lovely people, don't get me wrong. I, that's just where I'm coming from. And that's all I have to say. And thank you so much for all of your time and effort. Great. Thank you, Joanne. Can I quickly respond here, Ethan? Uh, sure. Um, quick. Here, I'll put, I'll put on my comment. I'll put on my mic. I'm, I'm sorry. I was fumbling to try to put on my cameras because I don't like just talking. It's just a big letter C. Um, two things. First of all, I am not opposed to, to, to the idea of um, Stockbridge voters voting for Stockbridge rep representatives and Rochester voters voting for Rochester representatives. That's just in direct conflict with, with what one of the same lawyers that you talked to, Ethan, told me. Um, and so that's where I'm like, let's put the brakes on this. Let's have, let's have the conversation. And I think we're gonna have it in a timely fashion. So it's, it, 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 it's not gonna affect me. The, the second point I wanted to make was that, um, you know, as far as what, actually, never mind. That, that's going to rabbit hole the conversation at very late. So uh, appreciate that, Carl. The, the, big, the big piece I want to say is that I wanted to comment that I'm not against the idea that that uh, Stockbridge voters should vote for Stockbridge representatives. That was not what the legal advice I had been given had been said, and I want to make sure before we amend things um, that we that that I've heard from legal counsel as well. Good, thank you. Okay, Tim Pratt, you're up. Do you have a comment? 
I do have a couple comments. So, like everybody else these days, I was on Zoom when you uh, asked the uh, full RSUD board if uh, you getting together a committee uh, to look at the articles would work, and you got an unanimous yes on that. I wasn't expecting you for you to get a hold of me and ask me to be on the committee. But, you know, I said, I either better shit or get off the pot. <laughs> so uh, I got on the committee, and one of the first things I said was, I think we need a second opinion from legal advice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had... You know, I know that there's an email floating around Rochester. I don't know the moron that started it that said that uh, Tim Pratt's going around saying that uh, Rochester, he wants Rochester out of the merge. If anybody has ever heard me say that, they were drunk because I have never, ever said that. I've been busting my butt for a couple of years talking to Southwest people to – on the side, say, what do you think about changing the article? And, you know, these are people that I know in Stockbridge. And they were like, we can't change the articles. So I did a little research, got a hold of Donald Savage, uh, called the AOE, and they would rather see articles of agreements change than a, a town trying to get out of a merge. So I, I did say that, here's what I did say. I'm not so concerned about Stockbridge going and doing their due diligence legally, going to the select board, going through the motions to uh, do their own voting. I have said, we've got two years to get our shit together to keep these two schools. Tim, Tim, don't forget this is public comment. Please keep your language clean. Thank you. Well, everybody that knows me knows I say it the way it's going. To, I know how I, it is. I just got to so, say that too. As a so yeah, okay. So we got to get our crap together to <laughs> to uh, try to save these two schools because that was one of the biggest things in the whole pre-merge. Stockbridge wanted to save their school. Rochester wanted to save our school. We just lost the high school. The day that we lost the high school, the budget should have gone down $300,000 overnight. That did not happen. The budget went up. So we didn't just lose that $300,000 by tuitioning our 25 students or whatever it was, 7 through 12. Because at the time, it was $25,000, $26,000, and they just went down to $18,000 getting tuitioned out. So uh, there's some concerns that I have as a Rochester person, you know, that has been here much longer than some of these people that are floating around these stupid emails, that I have seen the migration from Granville, Hancock, Rochester, Stockbridge, and we can't afford to lose more students from Hancock, but Carl was right about the tuition. If we don't collect $18,777, we're losing money. It is not revenue. And there, you know, I know that Barbara Hart was on board with me. And she disagrees with that statement. And her and Jamie could talk all day about how it is revenue, but. If I pay you twenty dollars and only check you out at eighteen, guess what? I'm losing two bucks an hour on you. So, good, Tim. I just got to say, we do we do legally. It is five minutes per person. So just keep keep your keep your points clear. I don't want to stop you, but I just I just want you to get all your points out. Okay, I understand. So, in the long and short of it, I think that in the in the in the next two years if we can show that we can have equity together equal representation we're just you know the, the committee recommended equal representation for uh board members being uh 
chosen by their own towns. Other towns in the district did it. So when that was one of the other reasons I said, let's get a second opinion from a whole different lawyer, from a whole different firm. And you did do your due diligence. I'll give you credit, Ethan. In the last two months, I think you've taken the bull by the horn and you've run with it. And and you aren't kicking the can down the road like every other issue has been done with this RSUD board for three years. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Tim. All right. We're down to the telephone numbers. I'll list the number. Um, star six to unmute. Please identify yourself. Um, so 518 star last two digits three one hello can you hear me yes i can hi my name is bridget and i teach online um i taught at rochester but i'm online this year and i work with um lindy hi lindy you're doing a great job <laughs> so i've been getting to know her really well um, i'm teaching online because my littlest daughter has some heart issues so it's not safe for me to be out Mm -hmm. But I just feel like it's probably beneficial to shut the schools down because just lots of things are making me nervous for coworkers, their kids, um, and the school and the families. Like even the idea of getting the kids outside. So like I know the kindergarten and first and second grade, they have their own entrance to go outside their own exit, but third through six don't. So if you assume there's like, maybe 40 kids and if they go outside six times a day for 15 minutes and they come in and out of the building when they get to school and when they leave that's probably 16 times a day the kids will be in and out because they have to come in school go to class then go outside for 15 minutes and come back in that it's I calculated it. It's over like 600 exposures and cross contamination in the hallway. And I know we're trying to come up with ideas, but I almost just think it's best to close things down and switch, you know, to all virtual because there's also like a tremendous number of um, employees in these both school districts that have COVID. And I just think we should really think about protecting the vulnerable because we don't really know the long lasting effects of this. And so I just wanted to share my thoughts with you about, you know, maybe closing down for a few months just to really protect everybody, especially Great. the vulnerable. So that's all. Thank you. Could you, I'm sorry, could you just repeat your name? I didn't get a chance to write it down clearly. Sure. It's Bridget Kim and I teach fourth and fifth grade online. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Well, one other thing, like I feel that all, I don't feel like there should be an, any in-person meetings anymore i feel like it all should switch to like a google meeting and really make sure that's happening but it's it's hard because you think you're in a smaller district and it's more intimate than a larger school i i just don't know if it's practical to remain open safely because you know they say it's airborne so if you take off your mask to eat unless you're eating outside you know, it's not like the virus stops and says, okay, wait a minute, they're having lunch and then comes back. So I just, I, I think the solution would be to just close down. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Number 774, last two digits, 59. Please start six to unmute and please um, identify yourself. Hey, this brings Cynthia. And I want to preface this with, um, I have not had children in the Stockbridge school system, but I've been paying taxes here for um, over 30 years. And I never got a reduction in my taxes for not having kids in the school. So I really feel like I've got um, a stake in this. Carl, I was really disappointed by your comment to, um, to the committee's work with the articles. Um, and then your last comment, it sounds like if you and Ethan both talked to the same lawyer and got different answers to the same question, then get yourselves another lawyer because he obviously doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, and this 
again, kick down the road. Um, no trust in the committee you set up. And that's the way you came across. Whether you feel that way or not, that's the way your comment came across. Um, very dismissive. Also, um, in terms of the COVID outbreak at the Stockbridge School, I found out about it through um, the grapevine. And uh, I understand that it's a really small community and we don't want to be blaming who brought it in and who has it and HIPAA rules and everything. But because it is such a small community, I was really angered that there was absolutely no announcement that I saw anywhere that there was a COVID outbreak in this town. And I went to an appointment for a woman who operates a personal care business in this town. And I canceled the appointment, but I thought, well, she's taking care of her business. She probably knows what to do. She found out about the COVID outbreak five minutes before I got there. And Stockbridge residents are going in and out of her business all day long. So I don't think anybody's taking care of the rest of us. And I, I just was really angry. And I voted for the merger. I'm voting to secede from the merger. Because every meeting I go to, I get, I, I listen to or, or went to in person, I just get more frustrated. I just don't think that this is, any of this is all about education. It's all about what the lawyers say. And that's my piece and take it for what it's worth. Good, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, 802 star star 37. Please identify yourself clearly. If you have a comment, star star Hi, Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Leah DeForge. Um, I have a daughter at your school. She's actually sleeping next to me right now. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know I appreciate everyone that has been working really hard to keep all of us safe. Um, I went to your school as a small child. My husband and I both did. Now my daughter's going here. I've paid my taxes the whole time that I've pretty much my adult life that I've worked because I think it's important that children have a place to go to school. And I understand right now things are not probably how they're ever going to be again. And um, I just wanted to let you guys know my perspective a little bit. Um, I found out on Wednesday that there was a COVID outbreak. Luckily, we we're going into break. My other daughter is going to daycare, so they both went to daycare on Monday and Tuesday. And so we all have people that are connected through this community and through COVID. And um, I just want to let you know as well that Jana will not be able to do online learning. I don't have a way or internet connection to make that happen. She's also in preschool, so it's not that big of a deal. But I just feel like the kids are losing out right now. And I do agree with the woman who said that maybe we do need to shut it down. But at the same time, how do you do that? Because really, we're all here for the kids. Hmm. And that's it. Great. Thank you so much, Leah. 802 star star 38. Hey, Ethan, it's Keith over at Stockbridge. Hi, Keith. Hi. Um, I think I'm going to reserve any comments right now. There are a lot of interesting topics brought up this evening. Um, I'd like to take a closer look at uh, the numbers and scenarios that uh, were presented by Jamie as he threw out quite a number of them and just mm -hmm. listening to them. Uh, didn't make, uh, couldn't make real sense of it. And then I'm waiting on some additional information. Um, I had contacted the BOE, and I'm waiting on some additional information from them regarding the articles. So to make any comments uh, based on what was said today, I think would be premature. So to be short and brief, that's it. Right. Thank you, Keith. And thank you for, you know, and, and many of the people who come to many meetings um, I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the feedback. Um, 
Uh, so, thanks. Um, I think I'm at 802 star star 45. Please identify yourself clearly. If you have a comment, star six to unmute. Okay, I'm gonna move on. 802, star star five three. Please, star six to unmute. Please identify yourself clearly. Hi, Ethan, this is Vic Roboto. Hi, Vic. Hey, well, first of all, I just want to uh, echo what others have said and to uh, thank you and the rest of the board for uh, the work you're doing. I mean, this is really hard work, time consuming, takes a lot of energy and persistence and patience. So I just want to say thank you for that. And also, you know, I posed three questions at the outset, and I've essentially gotten answers to all three, so I'm grateful for that, too. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, you've explained the rationale for the uh, the uh, amendment uh, task force, and I look forward to seeing what the finalized uh, amendments look like. So, you know, looking forward to that. And secondly, in terms of the impact of uh, separating, it looks like it's a pretty severe uh, impact on both towns. And, uh, you know... Uh, looking at uh, <laughs> the sizable FTE cuts to the two schools if that were to happen. So that's not good. And then Jamie, I think, spoke to the, the longer run issue. You know, what's the opportunity cost? And his comments about, uh, you know, given the demographics being what they are, that he said, we're going to have to look at how to do business differently down the road. So uh, that speaks to the opportunity cost question. So uh, I appreciate that. Um, and then also, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Lindy and Bonnie uh, and Jamie uh, for the, the hard work they're doing with uh, responding to COVID. Uh, this is all new ground, two territory. It's tough. It's scary trying to do the right thing. A lot of conflicting issues going on. Uh, so I, I know that's difficult. And I think uh, I just want to give a message of appreciation for that as well. That's all. Thank you, Vic. Thank you. And uh, finally, we have a uh, 802 star star 91. Please, I uh, star six to unmute and please identify yourself. This is Caitlin McKinstry. Hi, Ethan. Hi, How Caitlin. are you tonight? I am good. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple questions. Jamie, when you came up with uh, the budgeting numbers for if we were to separate when you did the salaries, did you count any of the positions that are shared as full, like full time at one place? Because from my understanding, I know that there were positions before the merge that were shared as well. So we just expensed them off based on the amount of FT in each building. We didn't make them full. Okay. Um, my other question pertaining to COVID, um, so I'm in nursing school right now, um, and we are required to get a COVID test every week. Have you guys uh, looked into possibly doing some tests? I know. Um, so, yeah, we are okay. testing. It's, it's voluntary. I can't require people to test. Um, but it, we are having voluntary testing on Wednesday and we're rotating it. We'll be tested once a month for staff. Okay. And, but you can't we do have make it mandatory. Last, we checked, uh, last time we had over, it was like 120 staff participated. And a few days ago I had 75 signed up and I expect that that increased, um, cause that was a few days ago. I expect over a hundred again across the SC. Caitlin, in the first round of testing, this is Lindy, in the first round of surveillance testing that we did in November, over 90% of our staff, teachers and support staff and you know bus drivers, over 90% participated in voluntarily in the testing. So it was a pretty active group that signed up to get tested. Okay, good. Um, and, and I didn't, also want to have any positives at that time. There was we came back totally clean. Okay, I'm I'm more looking at it as um, not not that you guys aren't doing your due diligence, but more of like a solution. Um, 
because mm-hmm. I know Gifford does drive through testing, although that test probably wouldn't work good for little ones because that's the one way, way back in the nose. Um, but they do have some that are just basic nasal swabs for 10 seconds in each nasal. I wonder, would the school accept a negative COVID test like that as documentation instead of like Charity had to go through all these hoops because her kids have allergies? I'm just wondering if maybe that would be an acceptable route, acceptable documentation um, to have because Gifford does a drive through and it usually comes back in three to five days. I know they say it can it can take up to 10 days, but it, it comes back pretty quickly with my my history of getting it done. Yeah, so Caitlin, we, we typically request either a doctor's note of improved health to return and or a negative test. And or, okay. and or, yeah. And or, okay. Um, but yeah, I do, and I just wanted to say from going to nursing school and going to VTC and we're online except when we're in clinical or when we're in lab and we have crazy um, restrictions when we are in lab and we're wearing the masks and the goggles and I think you guys are doing really great. This pain is felt throughout the learning spectrum, throughout the employment spectrum. So I think you guys are doing really great in trying to be creative in making things functional and work without, you know, completely shutting down, balancing the needs of families, having to work versus staying home with their kids. Um, I think you guys are doing really great with that. Um, The other thing I wanted to say is I feel like the, the committee that you've put together to look at these articles has done really great, has done their due diligence. I agree with the previous speaker that, that it was just very dismissed tonight. Um, and it does feel like it's just being postponed, um, mainly because it doesn't fit in with previous agendas of how the board has worked because it's different, because it's new. And despite all of the legalities that you guys have have gone to prove, um, other members of the board just just aren't willing to back that, unfortunately. And I feel like it's there's a large chance that this committee is just gonna be dismissed just like the building committee was. Um, And to you, Ethan, I know Rob asked you if his emails weigh on you, but I also want you to keep in mind that this is a man that when asked if he would let Stockbridge out of the merge, he said, why would Rochester do that? Why would we do that? He's also against amending the articles for the town to come up with an agreement. He's against each town being able to choose their own representation. And he talks about, well, what people voted for originally, but then when somebody from Stockbridge says that, he tells us it's old news. Like that was, that was then and this is now. We need to look towards the future. Um, and by all means, all of these things are recorded. I, I encourage you to listen to them, but um, I hope that his words don't weigh on you as much as he would like them to. And that's all I have to say. Great. Thank you, Caitlin. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your input and your time. Hey, hey, Ethan, Ethan, Ethan. Uh, before, you go, before you go to bed, it's Tim. Uh, uh, Tim. Uh, that uh, scheduled meeting that the board wants with a lawyer, what's the reason for that to be executive session? It's not, it's um, because, not real uh, lawyer, lawyer, lawyer privilege, you know, legal privilege. Comp. Same thing with the building, with the um, uh, transfer of the high school. Well, Anything that's real estate. To, that's real uh, estate. That's real estate. Yeah, and 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 anything else that has to do that is is attorney pr- client privilege. We are the client, and so it's it's uh, confidential to talk with our lawyers. That said, we will do once we do the the. Um, executive session, we will then come out and work on that amendment. 
and 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 vote it up or down. That's my goal. All right. Well, if you use that, that is my goal as well, says Carl. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Carl. Uh, let's Thank not you. get us into too much. Um, we're done. And we need to really be done, Tim, if that's okay. He's I don't want to push you off. Megan? I just want to say something about, um because I've heard from the public and about the Articles of Agreement Committee, and I did vote to move it till a next meeting on Tuesday. I am not, I just want to state as your Rochester representative, I'm not opposed to changing the Articles of Agreement. I just thought we were dealing with a lot in this meeting, and I was just asking for more time to give it a more thoughtful I, in process. I actually think that's uh, that's exactly what I was hearing too, and I think that's the right way. It's too big a thing to deal with in, in a meeting with everything else. It's just and it's, we want to do it. We want to give it proper consideration. So I don't want to. And to come Carl feeling as well. Yeah, I don't want it to come across that we are dismissive. It was really just wanting to give proper time to a very important issue. So thank you. And I will make sure that our work in the in the committee is heard. I greatly value it. Okay. okay. Without further announcements, uh, we have a uh, no future agenda items as this. We have scheduled a special meeting as of for Tuesday. I will get that warning out tomorrow. Um, and our next meeting date is uh, Tuesday, February 2nd, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. via Google Meet. Again, thank you for all the people listening and for your comments tonight. Thank you, Cricket, for staying on. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, and thank you to our administrators and staff for all the work. Um, this is, you know, this is democracy in action. So thank you all very much for being part of this. Um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I support everything you say, and I i guess I got, because I pontificated, I got uh, out moved on the move, so I will second. Excellent. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, let's go home.